Chapter 9, Part 2 of The Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass, by Apuleius. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter 9, Part 2. Scarcely had the old woman finished her tale, when the baker's wife thus resumed her discourse. Oh, how blessed is that woman who enjoys the liberty of associating with so firm a friend. But I, miserable creature, have met with a lover who is even frightened at the noise of the mill and the concealed face of that scabby ass. To this the old woman replied, I will even now cause that lover of yours to be with you promptly at the appointed time, well persuaded and resolute. And having likewise promised that she should return in the evening, she departed from the bedchamber. But that chaste wife immediately prepared a princely banquet. She defecates by percolation the precious wine, tempers the new-made pottage with seasoning, and furnishes the table with abundance of food. In short, the coming of the adulterer is expected like the advent or manifestation of some god. For opportunely the husband supped abroad at the house of a neighboring fuller. Midday, therefore, approaching, I being at length freed from my harness and permitted to refresh myself in quiet, I did not by Hercules so much rejoice in my liberation from labor as that, my eyes being uncovered, I should now be able to behold without restraint all the arts of the wicked woman. The sun, indeed, having now descended under the ocean, had illuminated the inferior parts of the earth, when, behold, the rash adulterer came, closely following the iniquitous old woman, he himself being very young, and still conspicuous by the polished smoothness of his chin, still being himself the delight of adulterers. The woman, having received him with many kisses, desired him to recline himself for the supper she had prepared. But no sooner had the young man touched with the extremity of his lips the cup, which was drunk out of previous to eating, and just begun to taste the food, than the husband came, returning much sooner than they expected. Then the egregious wife, having earnestly prayed for dire curses upon him, and wishing that he might break his legs, hid the adulterer trembling with pale fear under the wooden bin, which then happened to lie near her, in which a confused heap of corn was usually purified. And by her innate craft, dissembling a deed so wicked, and assuming an intrepid countenance, she inquired of her husband why he came home so prematurely relinquishing the supper of his most intimate companion. But he, with a mind perfectly afflicted and continually sighing, said, Not being able to bear the detestable and extreme wickedness of an abandoned woman, I took myself to flight. Good gods, what a wife! How faithful and how temperate! And yet she defiled herself with a most filthy crime. I swear by this holy series that I can even now scarcely believe the testimony of my eyes concerning such a woman. The most audacious wife of the baker, being incited by these words of her husband, and desiring to know the affair, did not cease to importune him to narrate the whole transaction from the beginning. Nor did she desist till her husband complied with her wish. And thus, being ignorant of the misfortune of his own house, he related that of the family of another. The wife of my associate, the fuller, who seemed to be a woman of undefiled chastity, and who, being always renowned for her modesty, chastely ruled the house of her husband, was inflamed with a secret love for a certain adulterer. And as she continually indulged in furtive embraces with that young man, she was in the act of being connected with him at the very moment of time in which we, having bathed, went to supper. Being therefore disturbed by our sudden presence, she hid him in a wicker coop, which being plaited from willow twigs into an erect heap, and smoked with the white fume of sulphur, was used for the purpose of whitening the cloth that was placed round it. And he being now safely concealed, as it seemed to her, she fearlessly participated with us at the table. 
in the meantime the young man being oppressed and obscured by the odour of the sulphur became faint through the interception of his breath and that living mineral caused him to sneeze frequently as it is natural for it to do but as soon as the husband who sat opposite to his wife heard the sound of sneezing behind his back because he thought it proceeded from his wife he wished her well in the usual words and this he did when he again heard the sneezing and also when it was frequently repeated till being moved by the excessive repetition of it he at length suspected what the thing was immediately therefore pushing away the table at which she sat and removing the coop he drew forth a man who was with great pain restoring his frequent emissions of breath and being inflamed with indignation on account of the disgraceful circumstance calling for a sword he longed to kill a man who would have expired in a short time unless i considering our common danger had through though with difficulty prevented him from his furious attack by assuring him that his enemy would shortly die through the powerful odour of the sulphur without any blame being attached to us and he being rendered more mild not by my persuasion but by the necessity of the thing itself brought him who was now but half alive into the next street then i secretly admonished and at length prevailed on his wife to withdraw herself for a short time from the shop and betake herself to a certain woman with whom she was familiar till the enraged mind of her husband should be appeased who i did not doubt was so exasperated and so agitated with fury that he would certainly perpetrate something more deadly both on himself and his wife and thus being wearied with the supper of my associate i returned to my own house while the baker narrated these particulars that shameless and audacious woman had long before the tale was finished expressed by execrations how much she detested the wife of the fuller calling her perfidious unchaste and lastly the great disgrace of all her sex who laying aside her own modesty and trampling on the league of the marriage bed had defiled with meretricious infamy the house of her husband and now had procured for herself the name of a prostitute having lost the dignity of a married woman she added that such females ought to be burnt alive nevertheless through the joint admonition of her silent wound and her own filthy conscience in order that she might sooner liberate her adulterer from the torment of his covering she frequently urged her husband to go to bed as soon as possible he however mildly requested that the table might be placed for him as his supper being intercepted at the house of the fuller he had fled from thence perfectly hungry then the wife hastily set the table before him though unwillingly because it was designed for another person but my bowels were perfectly lacerated when i reflected on the preceding wickedness and the present audacity of this most abandoned woman and i sedulously deliberated with myself whether i could by any means give assistance to my master by detecting and revealing the fraud of his wife and by throwing off the covering exposed to the view of every one him who was concealed like a tortoise under the bin at length divine providence regarded me thus tormented with the disgrace of my master for the lame old man to whose care our custody was committed led all us labouring beasts collected into one body to the next lake for the sake of drinking the time now requiring that this should be done and this circumstance administered to me a most opportune occasion of revenge for in passing by i observed the extremities of the fingers of the adulterer which were protuberant through the narrow openings of the hollow covering and pressing these with my inflected and sharp hoof i bruised them so as to reduce them to the greatest tenuity till being excited by the intolerable pain he sent forth a sorrowful clamour and pushing away and throwing down the bin he unfolded to the sight of all that were present the scenic apparatus of the lecherous woman nevertheless the baker not being greatly disturbed by the loss of his wife's modesty thus began to soothe with a serene front and conciliated face the young man who was trembling with exsanguous paleness you need not fear my son that anything of a sorrowful nature will be inflicted on you by me i am not a barbarian nor endued with a rustic deformity of manners 
nor will I kill you with the deadly fume of sulphur after the example of the truculent fuller, nor indeed will I bring such an elegant and beautiful youth in danger of losing his life through the severity of the law concerning adultery. But I will divide with my wife my pleasure with you, and she shall be common both to you and me. For I have always lived with my wife in such concord that, according to the dogma of the philosophers, the same things are pleasing to both of us. But neither does equity suffer the wife to have more authority than the husband. With such like flattering language, having derided the young man, he led him reluctant to a bed, and sending away his most chaste wife who followed him to another bed, he, lying alone with the youth, enjoyed the most grateful avengement of corrupted nuptials. But as soon as the lucid chariot of the sun had made the day, the baker, having called two of his most robust servants and striking with a ferrule of the buttocks of the youth, who was lifted to a considerable height for the purpose, said to him, Do you who are so soft and tender and but a boy, defrauding lovers, wantonly desire women in the flower of your age and commit adultery with such as are free and connected by the conjugal compact and vindicate to yourself the unseasonable name of an adulterer? Having reproached him in these and many other words, and besides this punished him abundantly with blows, he turned him out of doors. He, however, being the bravest of all adulterers, having obtained unhoped for safety, though his fair posteriors had been burst by night, and for a long time, sorrowfully fled. Nevertheless, the baker divorced his wife, and immediately thrust her out of her own house. But she, besides her genuine wickedness, being profoundly excited and exasperated by the contumelious language of her husband, though it was just, returned to her treasury of fraud and the accustomed arts of females, and with great care searched for a certain crafty woman who was believed to be capable of effecting anything by incantations and sorcery, besought her with many prayers, and burdened her with many gifts, requesting of her one of two things, to wit, that she would either again cause her to be reconciled to her husband by appeasing him, or, if that could not be accomplished, that she would send some ghost or some dire demoniacal power to take away his life by violent means. Then that sorceress, and who was capable of effecting divine works, employed at first only the milder instruments of her wicked art, and endeavoured to bend the mind of the husband that had been vehemently offended, and impel it to love. But when the event of the thing was different from what she expected, being indignant with the gods, and besides the loss of the gain which she would have obtained if she had succeeded, being also stimulated by the contempt which she had sustained from the divine powers, she now began to attack the life of the most miserable husband, and to stimulate to his destruction the ghost of a certain woman who had suffered a violent death. Perhaps, however, O scrupulous reader, you reprehending my narration will argue as follows. But whence, O foolish ass, could you know what was done by women in secret, as you say you did, when, at the same time, you were confined within the boundaries of a bakehouse? Here, therefore, how a curious man, sustaining the form of an ass, knew all that was transacted with a view to the destruction of my master, the baker. Nearly about midday, a woman suddenly appeared in the bakehouse, deformed with severe sorrow, as if she was guilty of some crime, half clothed with a coarse mantle, having her feet naked and without shoes. And being thus ill-favoured through leanness, there was in her face a paleness like that of box. Her hair likewise was half grey, torn, and filthy through the interspersion of ashes, and, hanging over her forehead, concealed the greatest part of her face. This woman, thus deformed in her attire, gently with her hand taking hold of the baker, led him into his bedchamber as if she had something to say to him in secret and having shut the door, she stayed there a long time. But when all the corn was ground which had been given to the servants of the baker, and it became necessary to ask for more, 
the lesser men servants standing near the bedchamber called their master by name and asked for more corn to supply the mill and as no master answered them though they frequently called him and with a loud voice they now more forcibly knocked at the door because likewise it had been most carefully bolted suspecting something of greater consequence and of a worse nature than usual with great effort they at length either plucked off or broke the hinges and made an entrance for themselves that woman however was nowhere to be found but they saw their master hanging from a certain beam to which he was tied and now lifeless freeing him therefore from the knot by which his neck was fastened they took him down from the beam with the greatest lamentations and weeping and procured for his corpse the last ablution having likewise performed the offices pertaining to the dead they buried him a great crowd attending the funeral on the following day his daughter came running from the next little town in which she had lately been married sorrowful shaking her pendulous hairs and sometimes beating her breasts with her hands for she knew all that happened though no one had narrated to her the misfortune of the house because the lamentable form of her father had presented itself to her in sleep having the neck still tied with a cord and unfolded to her all the wickedness of her stepmother the adultery the enchantment and how he had descended to the realms beneath being strangled by a nocturnal ghost and when she had tormented herself by long continued lamentation at length being restrained by the concourse of her friends and acquaintance she gave a pause to her grief and now the funeral solemnities being in the usual manner completed as his sepulchre on the ninth day she brought forth the servants the furniture and all the laboring beasts to be sold by auction then the rash fortune of an uncertain sale dispersed in various ways the property of one house lastly a certain poor gardener bought me for fifty pieces of money which he said was a great price but he purchased me in order that he might procure food for himself by our common labor and the thing itself appears to me to require that i should also explain the discipline of this my servitude in the morning my master was accustomed to drive me to the next city laden with many herbs and after he parted with them for a certain sum of money to those who sold them to others he thus returned to his garden sitting on my back but while he was digging and watering and performing other rural works in a bent position i in the meantime being at leisure refreshed myself with placid quiet behold however the year running back through the number of days and months by orderly and established circulations of the stars had descended to the wintry frosts of capricorn after the pleasures of the vintages of autumn but i was tormented by continual cold through the daily rains and the nightly dews being exposed to the open air and shut up in an uncovered stable for my master on account of his great poverty could not purchase even for himself and much less for me some straw or a small covering but he lived contented with the leafy umbrage which his little cottage afforded. Besides this, also in the morning I endured great labor in walking with unshod feet on excessively cold clay and pieces of very sharp ice, and was not able to fill my belly with my accustomed food, for both my master and myself had an equal and similar supper, and it was very slender, since it consisted of old and unsavory lettuces, which having through the great age of the seeds grown into an irregular height like long brooms had degenerated into the bitter putridity of muddy juice on a certain night the master of a family of the next village being impeded by the darkness of a moonless night and wet through a heavy shower of rain and in consequence of this prevented from pursuing his journey in the direct road turned out of the way with his now wearied horse to our garden and being as courteously received as the time would permit though not in a delicate yet in a necessary succour of rest and desiring to remunerate his benignant host he promised that he would give him from his farm some corn and oil and besides this two caddy of wine 
but my master without delay proceeded to the village of that master of a family which was distant from his garden sixty stadia sitting on my naked back and bringing with him a little sack and empty bladders and this journey being now finished we came to the before-mentioned farm and there the benignant host immediately gave my master to partake of a sumptuous dinner while too they were exciting each other alternately to drink a perfectly stupendous prodigy happened to take place a hen belonging to a coop in which others were kept running through the middle area made a noise with her native clangor as if she wanted to lay an egg her master beholding her said oh good servant and sufficiently prolific who for a long time hast nourished us with the eggs which thou hast daily brought forth now also as i see you think about preparing for us a breakfast and ho oh, boy said he speaking to one of his servants let the basket appointed for the hens when they are about to lay eggs be placed in the accustomed corner while the boy was doing what he was ordered to do the hen kicking away the bed which had been made for her as usual in the basket brought forth before the very feet of her master a premature offspring which was portentous of something very dire for she did not bring forth an egg such as we know a hen is accustomed to do but a chicken perfectly furnished with feathers and claws and eyes and voice and which immediately began to follow its mother in a similar manner also another prodigy arose far greater than the former and at which all men would be justly terrified for under the very table which sustained the relics of the dinner the earth opening itself from the bottom a most copious fountain of blood burst forth and many drops rebounding from thence sprinkled the table with gore at that very moment likewise in which all that were present were fixed in astonishment admiring and trembling at those divine portents one of the servants ran from the wine cellar announcing that all the wine which had long ago been deposited in it boiled up in all the vessels with a fervent heat and just as if a large fire had been put under it in the meantime also weasels were seen out of the house drawing into it a dead serpent a small green frog leaped out of the mouth of a shepherd's dog and a ram rushing on the dog which stood near him strangled him by one bite these prodigies so many and so great produced an extreme stupor with great fear in the minds of the master of that house and all of his family so that they knew not what should be done first or last what would more or what would less appease the anger of the gods or how many and what kinds of expiatory victims should be procured and while all of them were still torpid through the expectation of some most horrible subject of fear a certain little servant came running and announced to the master the great and extreme destruction of his family for he lived full of glory through having three sons now adult furnished with learning and endued with modesty between these young men and a certain poor man the master of a small cottage there was an ancient familiarity but a powerful rich and young neighbor and who badly used the renown of his ancestors race possessed ample and fertile fields contiguous to that small cottage and as he was powerful in the number of his dependents and easily accomplished in the city whatever he pleased he behaved in a very hostile manner to a poor man who was his neighbor by killing his sheep taking away his oxen and trampling on his corn before it was ripe when also he had now entirely deprived him of the product of his labor he likewise desired to expel him from the possession of his farm and exciting a frivolous controversy about the boundaries of the fields he vindicated the whole of the land to himself then that rustic who was otherwise a simple harmless man seeing himself plundered through the avarice of a rich man in order that he might at least retain enough of his paternal land for a sepulchre collected together with great trepidation many friends for the purpose of demonstrating to them what were the boundaries of his land among others those three brothers were present affording some small assistance to the great misfortune of their friend 
nevertheless the insanely furious rich man not being in the least terrified or even confused by the presence of many citizens not only was unwilling to abstain from rapine but also from intemperance of language for when they mildly expostulated with him and endeavoured to mitigate his fierce manners by soothing words he immediately swearing most sacredly by his own safety and that of his friends asserted that he considered the presence of so many mediators to be a thing of small consequence and lastly that he would order his servants to take that neighbour of his by the ears and expel him to a great distance from his little cottage and that this should be done immediately when he had thus said the greatest indignation was excited in the minds of all that heard him then one of the three brothers answered without delay and a little more freely that he in vain trusting to his riches threatened with tyrannic pride since the poor also are accustomed to be avenged of the insolence of the rich through the liberal aid afforded by the laws such as oil is to flame sulphur to burning and a whip to the furies such was the fuel of these words to this furious man and now being insensate even to extreme insanity and proclaiming that he would send all of them and their laws to to be hanged he ordered the shepherd's dogs to be liberated and also the mastiffs that were fierce and cruel and accustomed to feed on the dead bodies that were thrown into the fields and besides this were nourished by the bites with which they everywhere lacerated the passing traveller and he likewise commanded that they should be urged to the destruction of the men that were present but these as soon as by the accustomed signal of the shepherds they were excited and inflamed rushed on the men with furious rage being at the same time horrible by their dissonant barking and attacking they plucked their flesh and lacerate them with various wounds nor did they even spare them while they fled but being more irritated by their flight more eagerly pursued them then among the condensed slaughter of a trembling and flying multitude the youngest of the three brothers stumbled against a stone and having bruised his fingers was thrown on the ground and furnished a nefarious feast to those cruel and most ferocious dogs for immediately having found a prostrate prey they tore in pieces the miserable young man and as soon as the rest of his brothers knew that he was dying by his piercing cries they ran overwhelmed with sorrow to give him assistance and rolling their garments about their left hands they strive to defend their brother and to drive off the dogs by throwing at them many stones they could not however either terrify or vanquish their ferocity for well, the miserable young man being torn in pieces immediately died entreating with his last words that they would revenge the death of their youngest brother on that most filthy rich man then the two remaining brothers not by hercules so much despairing of as voluntarily neglecting their own safety hastily attacked the wealthy man and hurled many stones at him with great ardour and a furious impetus but the bloody murderer who prior to this had been exercised in many similar abominable deeds throwing a lance pierced one of the two brothers through the middle of the breast yet the young man did not fall on the ground though he was slain and perfectly lifeless for the lance which had penetrated through him and the greater part of which came out at his back was by the violence of the impulse fixed in the earth and kept his body suspended by its firmness and rigidity but one of the servants also who was tall and robust giving assistance to that homicide sent from afar a stone with great force at the right arm of the third brother but the stone passing through the extremities of his fingers with a vain impetus fell to the ground innoxious contrary to the opinion of all that were present nevertheless this milder event administered to the most sagacious young man some hope of revenge for pretending that his hand was debilitated by the blow he thus addressed the most cruel wealthy man enjoy the destruction of the whole of our family feed your insatiable cruelty with the blood of three brothers and triumph gloriously over your prostrate citizens only remember that you will always have some neighbour though you may give a still greater and greater extent to the boundaries of your lands for this my right hand which would have entirely cut off your head now being bruised is rendered incapable of effecting this through the iniquity of fate the furious thief being exasperated by this speech seizing a sword rushed on the most miserable young man 
intending to slay him with his own hand. He did not, however, attack one who was weaker than himself, for the young man, unexpectedly resisting, and far contrary to his opinion, seized his right hand with a most strong embrace, and brandishing the sword with a great effort, expelled the impure soul of the rich man by many and frequent blows, and that he might also liberate himself from the hands of his domestics, who were running to the assistance of their master, he immediately cut his throat with the sword which was yet sprinkled with the blood of his enemy. These were the things which the before-mentioned astonishing prodigies had foreshown, and these were the circumstances which were narrated to the most miserable master. Nor could the old man, surrounded by so many evils, utter any word, or even silently weep. But, seizing the knife with which he had then divided among his guests the cheese and other parts of the dinner, he also sorely wounded his own throat with many stabs, in imitation of his most unhappy son, till, falling prone on the table, he washed away with a river of new blood the stains of that portentous blood which suddenly burst forth from the earth. The gardener, commiserating the fate of that house, which was after this manner destroyed in the shortest space of time, and grievously deploring the cruel events which had taken place, and also paying for his dinner with tears, and frequently striking together his empty hands, he immediately got on my back and returned through the road by which we came. His return, however, was not at least innoxious to him, for a certain tall man, who was a legionary soldier, as his dress and appearance indicated, meeting us on the road, asked the gardener, in proud and arrogant language, whither he was leading an empty ass. But my master, who was yet full of grief, and besides this was ignorant of the Latin tongue, silently passed by him. The soldier, therefore, being indignant at his silence, as a mark of contempt, thrust him from my back, at the same time striking him with the branch of a vine which he held in his hand. Then the gardener suppliantly answered that he could not know what he said through his ignorance of the Latin tongue. The soldier, therefore, subjoining, in Greek, said, Whither do you lead this ass? The gardener answered that he was going to the next city. But I, said the soldier, am in want of its assistance, for it is requisite that it should carry from the neighboring little town with other laboring beasts the baggage of our prefect and immediately laying hold of the rope by which i was led he began to draw me along but the gardener wiping away the blood which trickled from his head through the wound of the former blow again entreated the soldier to act by him more humanely and mildly and this he did conjuring him by his prosperous hopes for this ass said he is sluggish and besides this frequently falls to that detestable disease epilepsy, and it is with great difficulty that he usually carries a few bundles of herbs from a neighboring garden, and in doing this he is fatigued, and his respiration is languid. So far is he from being adapted to carry larger burdens. After perceiving, however, that the soldier could not be appeased by any prayers, but was in a greater degree incited to his destruction, and that now having inverted the vine branch he was preparing to fracture his skull with a larger knot of the branch he fled to his last resource and feigning that he wished to embrace his knees in order to excite his compassion he inclined and bent himself and taking hold of both his feet lifted him up and violently dashed him to the ground immediately afterwards likewise he struck every part of his face his hands and his sides at one time with his fists, at another with his elbows, and besides this he bit him, and beat him with a stone taken up in the road. Nor could the soldier either resist or by any means defend himself after he was laid prostrate on the ground, but could only frequently threaten that if he rose again he would cut him in pieces with his sword. The gardener, being admonished by these words, snatched the sword from him, and throwing it to a great distance again attacked him with severer blows. But the soldier, being prostrate and prevented by wounds from defending himself, as he could not find any other means of safety, feigned that he was dead, which was the only thing that remained for him to do. Then the gardener, taking with him that sword, got on my back and proceeded rapidly in a direct line to the city, and, not even thinking of at least visiting his own garden, 
he betook himself to a certain person with whom he was familiarly acquainted, and having narrated to this friend everything which had happened to him, he implored his assistance in his present dangerous situation, and requested that he would conceal him and his ass for some time, till he had escaped a capital indictment by being latent for two or three days. But this acquaintance, not being forgetful of ancient friendship, promptly received him, and having drawn me, my legs being folded together, by means of a ladder into the highest room of the house, the gardener crept into a certain chest that was in the cellar, and covering himself over with the lid of it, there lay concealed. The soldier, however, as I afterwards learned, being at length roused, as if from excessive intoxication, nevertheless staggering and feeble, from the pain of so many wounds, and scarcely able to support himself by a staff, came into the city, and fearing to mention to any one of the citizens any particulars of his violence and inertness, but tacitly devouring the injury he had sustained, when he met with some of his fellow soldiers, he then told them of his misfortune. But they were of opinion that he should conceal himself for some time in their military dwelling, for besides his own proper disgrace, he feared also the military genius who presides over the military oath, on account of the sword which he had lost. They, however, having observed our footsteps, diligently applied themselves to the discovery of us, and to their own revenge. Nor was a perfidious neighbor wanting, who told them that we were there concealed. Then his fellow soldiers went to the magistrates, and pretended that they had lost on the road a very valuable silver vessel belonging to their prefect, and that a certain gardener had found it and was unwilling to restore it, but it was now concealed in the house of a friend. Then the magistrates, becoming acquainted with the loss and the name of the prefect, came to the gate of our dwelling, and with a loud voice announced to our host that it would be better for him to deliver us up, who were certainly concealed in his house, than to undergo the danger of losing his life. But he, not being in the least terrified and consulting the safety of him whom he had taken under his protection, did not confess anything concerning us, and asserted that he had not seen that gardener for some days. On the contrary, the soldiers, swearing by the genius of the emperor, affirmed that he was concealed there and not in any other place. At length, however, the magistrates were determined, by investigation, to confute him in his obstinate denial. Having therefore sent the lictors into his house, and the other public ministers, they ordered them diligently to explore everything in all the corners of the apartments. But they, having searched, declared that no man, nor even the ass itself, were to be found in any part of the house. Then the altercation became more vehement on both sides, on the part of the soldiers, who asserted that we were certainly there, and frequently implored the assistance of Caesar and on the part of the master of the house, who denied the accusation, and continually called the gods to testify the truth of what he said. I, therefore, who was in other respects an inquisitive ass, and endued with a restless petulance, when I heard the contention and clamorous murmur, was desirous, by looking through a certain window with my neck in an oblique position, to see what was the meaning of that tumult. And while I was so doing, one of the soldiers, having by chance turned his eyes to my shadow, called all of them to be witnesses of it publicly. Lastly, a great clamor was presently raised, and certain persons immediately coming to me by the assistance of ladders, laid their hands on me and drew me from the place of my concealment as a captive. And now, without any delay, more carefully exploring everything, and uncovering also the chest, they found the miserable gardener, drew him out from thence, presented him to the magistrates, and led him to a public prison, in order that he might suffer capital punishment. Nor could they refrain from jesting, accompanied with the greatest laughter at my looking out of the window. Whence also the proverb originated, which is very much used, concerning the inspection and shadow of an ass. End of chapter 9, part 2 Recording by Thomas Copeland Chapter 10, Part 1 of The Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tim Ferreira. The Metamorphosis or Golden Ass by Apuleius, translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter Ten, Part One. What my master the gardener did on the following day I know not. But the soldier, who was most beautifully beaten, on account of his extreme imbecility, loosened me and brought me away from that manger without the prohibition of any one. From his own tent also, as it appeared to me, he led me into the public road, laden with his own bundles, and perfectly adorned and equipped in a military manner. For he placed on my back a glittering helmet, a shield far more splendid than the rest of the armor, and also a lance, conspicuous for its very long steel head, which he diligently disposed on the top of the bundles, as it is usual to do in an army, not then, indeed, for the sake of discipline, but for the purpose of terrifying miserable travellers. Having, therefore, passed over the plains, which was attended with no difficulty, we came to a certain little town, nor did we then betake ourselves to an inn, but to the house of a decurion. And when the soldier had delivered me to the care of a certain servant, he, without delay, solicitously proceeded to his own prefect, who had the command of a thousand soldiers. I remember that a most wicked and detestable deed was perpetrated in that town a few days after our arrival, but I will insert it in my book that you also may read it. The master of that house had a son, who was a young man of great literary attainments, and, on that account, was consequently remarkable for his piety and modesty, so that you also would wish to have him, or his like, for a son. The mother of this young man having been dead for many years, the father had married again and from another wife had begotten another son, who had now just passed beyond the twelfth year of his age. But the stepmother, who was powerful in the house of her husband, rather from her beauty than the worthiness of her manners, regarded her son-in-law with wanton eyes, whether she was naturally immodest or was impelled by fate to that extreme wickedness. Now, therefore, excellent reader, know that you will peruse a tragedy and not a comedy, and that you will ascend from a shoe to the buskin. As long, however, as the amatory desire which she nourished from the beginning was small, its force being yet imbecile. The woman, easily repressing the slender frame, resisted it in silence. But when love, immoderately raging, burnt the whole of her breast with an insane fire, she was then vanquished by the fierce and tyrannical god, and, feigning illness, she pretended that her disease was not mental, but occasioned by the languid state of her body. Now there is not any one who is ignorant that all the detriments which the health and the face sustain accurately accord both with those that are ill and those that are in love, such as a deformed paleness, marcid eyes, weary legs, turbulent sleep, and sighs, more vehement from the slowness of the torment by which they are produced. You might believe she was only agitated by feverish vapors if she had not also wept. Alas, unskillful physicians, what to the pulsation of the artery, immoderate heat, wearied respiration, and the frequent and reciprocal changes and turnings of the sides indicate? Good gods! How easy is the comprehension of amatory desire by one who is learned, though he does not profess the medical art, when he sees someone burning with bodily heat. Being, therefore, more profoundly agitated by the impatience of venereal fury, she at length burst her long silence, and ordered her son to be called to her, which name she would have willingly obliterated in him, in order that she might not, by using it, be admonished of her shameless passion. Nor did the young man make any delay in obeying the mandate of his diseased parent, but, having his forehead wrinkled with sorrow for her pretended illness, like that of an old man, he went into the bedchamber of the wife of his father and the mother of his brother, paying that obedience to which was, in a certain respect, her due. But she, being for a long time fatigued by tormenting silence, and hesitating, as in a shallow of doubt, rejecting every word, which she at first conceived to be most adapted to the present occasion, and even now fluctuating through shame, she was dubious when she should assume the exordium of her speech. The young man, however, not then suspecting anything sinister, with a dejected countenance, spontaneously asked her what were the causes of her present disease. Then she, availing herself of the pernicious opportunity afforded by solitude, burst out into audacity and weeping abundantly, and hiding her face with her garment, with a trembling voice thus briefly addressed him. You yourself are the whole cause and origin of this my disease, and you are also the remedy and the only health of my life. For those eyes of yours, having penetrated through my eyes into the most inward recesses of my breast, have there excited a most vehement fire. Take pity, therefore, on me, who am perishing for your sake. Nor should your reverential regard for your father at all deter you, since, by complying with my wishes, you will preserve for him a wife who must otherwise die. For I justly love you, in consequence of recognizing his image in your face. You will be perfectly secure on account of the solitude of the place, 
and you will also have leisure sufficient for the accomplishment of this necessary crime. For that which no one knows has nearly no existence. The young man, being disturbed by the sudden evil, though he immediately abhorred such an abominable deed, yet did not think it fit to exasperate her by the unseasonable severity of a denial, but to appease her by the procrastination of a crafty promise. He promised, therefore, abundantly, and earnestly persuaded her to keep up her spirits, restore her strength by nutriment, and pay attention to her health, till a free space of time should be granted to pleasure, by some journey of his father. And he immediately withdrew himself from the noxious view of his stepmother. Conceiving likewise that this great destruction with which his house was threatened required more abundant counsel, he immediately related the affair to a certain aged tutor of well-tried gravity and prudence. And, after long-continued deliberation, nothing seemed to be so salutary as to escape the tempest of raging fortune by a rapid flight. But the woman, being impatient even of the smallest delay, having devised a certain occasion, immediately persuaded her husband, with wonderful art, to take a journey, with all speed, to certain little farms which were situated at a great distance. Which being done, she, precipitately, urged by the insanity of accelerated hope, demands the accomplishment of the promised gratification of her lust. The young man, however, avoids her execrable sight, adducing at one time this thing, and at another that, as the cause of his delay. Till she, manifestly perceiving from the variety of his messages that he refused to fulfill his promise to her, transferred with the lubricous mobility, her nefarious love to a far more pernicious hatred, and immediately calling a most iniquitous servant whom she had brought with her dowry to her husband, and who was prepared for the perpetration of any wickedness, she communicated to him the counsels of her perfidy, nor did anything seem to them to be better than to deprive the miserable young man of life. She immediately, therefore, sent this villainous servant to buy the most effective poison, and having diligently diluted it with wine, she prepared it for the destruction of her innocent son-in-law. And while the wicked servant and stepmother deliberate with themselves about the fit time of giving him the poison, it happened that the junior youth, who was the proper son of this most abandoned woman, returning home after the labor of his morning studies, and being thirsty after taking his breakfast, found the cup of wine, in which the enclosed poison was concealed, and drank it up at one draught, being ignorant of the latent fraud which it contained, who, as soon as he had drank the death which had been prepared for his brother, fell lifeless on the ground. Immediately the tutor of the youth, being agitated by his sudden death, called the mother and all the family, with a howling clamor. And now, the case of the noxious potion being known, each of those that were present ascribed to different authors the nefarious deed. But that dire woman, and who was a singular example of novercal malice, not being at all moved by the bitter death of her son, nor by the consciousness of parricide, nor by the misfortune of her house, nor the grief of her husband, nor funereal sorrow, took a shorter method of revenge, by the destruction of her family. She immediately, therefore, sent a courier to inform her husband, on his journey, of the calamity that had befallen his house. And on his arrival, he having rapidly returned, she, assuming excessive audacity, pretended that her son was destroyed by poison, administered to him by her son-in-law. And, in asserting this, indeed, she did not altogether speak falsely, because the boy had preoccupied the death which was prepared for the young man. But she feigned that the younger brother was destroyed through the wickedness of her son-in-law, because he was unwilling to give assistance to the disgraceful lust by which her son-in-law had endeavored to commit adultery with her. Nor was she contented with lies so enormous, but she also added that he threatened her with a sword, because she had detected his wickedness. Then the unhappy man, being greatly afflicted by the death of both his sons, is agitated like the waves of the sea with mighty tempests of sorrow. For he saw his younger son buried before his face, and he knew that his other son would certainly be condemned to death for incest and parricide. Besides this, also, he was impelled to extreme hatred of this son by the feigned lamentations of his too dearly beloved wife. Scarcely, therefore, were the funeral rites pertaining to the interment of his son performed, when immediately the miserable old man hastily proceeded from his pyre to the forum, irrigating his face with tears yet recent, and tearing his hoary hairs defiled with ashes. And there, with all his passions at work, he endeavors to procure the destruction of his remaining son, both by tears and supplications, and, for this purpose also, embracing the knees of the senators, being ignorant of the fraud of the most abandoned woman, he exclaimed that his son was incestuous, through his attempting to violate the paternal bed, a parricide through the death of his brother, and a matricide because he had attempted to kill his stepmother. Lastly, thus lamenting, he inflamed with so much commiseration, and with such great indignation, the senate and the people, that, laying aside the tediousness of a judicial process, 
and the manifest proofs of accusation, and also the meditated labyrinths of answer, they all cried out that a public evil should be punished publicly, and that the author of it should be destroyed by being overwhelmed with stones. In the meantime, the magistrates, through the fear of peculiar danger, namely, lest sedition should proceed from the small elements of indignation, to the destruction of discipline in the city itself, began partly to beseech the senators, and partly to restrain the people, that sentence might be pronounced conformably to the civil law, judgment being properly passed according to the custom of their ancestors, and the allegations on both sides equitably examined. They added, that no one should be condemned without a hearing, after the manner of barbaric fierceness, or tyrannic violence, since by doing so they would leave, in this time of profound peace, a dire example to posterity. The salutary council pleased them, and immediately the crier was ordered to proclaim that the senators should assemble together in the senate house. But when these were seated in their accustomed places, according to the order of their dignity, the crier again calling, the first accuser came forward. Then, in the last place, the defendant also being cited, was introduced and the crier, in conformity to the Attic law and that of the Areopagus, announced to the advocates that they should plead without preambles and without endeavoring to excite commiseration. I knew that these things were thus transacted from what was said by many in their conferences with each other, but as I was not present at the trial because I was tied to the manger, I could not know what words the accuser employed, nor by what arguments the defendant confuted him, nor in short what were the speeches and answers, nor can I narrate to you things of which I am ignorant, but I shall only commit to writing what I have found to be certainly true. For as soon as the contention of the orators was finished, the senators thought fit that the truth and credibility of the crime should be shown by certain proofs, and that a thing of such consequence should not be left to suspicions and conjecture. They likewise thought it requisite that the servant who was said to be the only one that knew these things were thus transacted, should by all means be brought forward. Nor was that disciple of the cross in the least disturbed, either by the doubtful event of so great a prosecution, or by the view of a full court, or even by his own evil conscience, but began to affirm and assert those things which he had himself devised, as if they were true. For he said, that the young man, being indignant with the fastidiousness of his mother-in-law, had called him, that in order to avenge the injury he had ordered him to destroy her son, that he had promised him a great reward if he was silent, that on his refusing to do what he wished, he had threatened him with death, that he had delivered to him the poison diluted with his own hand, to be given to his brother, and that on his suspecting he had neglected to give him the potion, and had reserved it for a proof of the crime, he at length had extended it to the boy with his own hand. When this villainous knave, with a feigned trepidation, had uttered these egregious lies, which had very much the appearance of truth, the inquiries and proofs were finished. Nor was any one of the senators so favorable to the young man as not to pronounce that he ought to be sewed up in a leathern sack, as he was evidently found to be guilty of the crime of which he was accused. The opinions of all of them being concordant, according to the custom perpetually observed, they were to have been committed to writing in tablets or shells, and put into an urn, after which the die being cast it was not lawful for anything to be changed, but the life of the accused person was in the hand of the executioner. Before this, however, could be done, a certain physician belonged to the Senate of an advanced age, of transcendent fidelity, and of great authority, covering with his hand the orifice of the urn, lest any one should rashly put into it his shell, thus addressed the court. I rejoice that I have lived long, because, even as far as to this period of my life, I have obtained your approbation. Nor will I suffer a manifest homicide to be perpetrated, since this defendant is accused of false crimes, nor you who, being bound by an oath, act as judges to commit perjury, being induced to do so by the lying testimony of a servant. I myself cannot bear to decide iniquitously, deceiving my own conscience, and trampling on the reverence which is due to the gods. Learn, therefore, from me the truth of the affair. This villainous fellow, being solicitous to procure the most effective poison, which he said was necessary for a certain sick person, who, being vehemently afflicted by the long continuance of an incurable disease, was anxious to withdraw himself from the torments of life, this fellow came to me some time ago, and offered me a hundred golden solidi, which is to say a hundred shillings, for the purchase of the poison. But I, perceiving the vain blabbering of that iniquitous knave, and that he assigned unappropriate causes, and also being certain that he was about to perpetrate something iniquitous, I gave him indeed a potion, but providing for an investigation into the affair which might be made at some future time, I did not immediately accept the price which he offered me. But I said to him, Lest by chance some one of these golden solidi which you offer me should be found to be bad, or adulterated, 
deposit them in this bag, and impress it with your own seal, till they are to-morrow examined in the presence of a banker. Being persuaded by what I said, he sealed the money, which, immediately after he was brought here to give evidence, I ordered one of my servants to take speedily from my shop and bring it to this place. And behold, I will exhibit them to you taken out of the bag. Let him see and recognize his own seal, for how can the son-in-law of the stepmother be accused of having procured the poison which this servant bought? After this a great trepidation seized the villain, a deadly paleness succeeded to his native color, and a cold sweat ran through all his members. Then he began to move his feet with uncertain alternations, to scratch now this, now that part of his head, and to utter foolish I know not what trifles, stammering with a half-closed mouth, so that no one could justly think him to be entirely innocent of the crime. His craft, however, being again restored, he did not cease to deny the charge most firmly, and to accuse the physician of a lie. But the physician, independently of his being bound by oath to decide justly, when he saw that his honor was openly lacerated, endeavored with an increased effort to confute that nefarious knave, till the public servants, by order of the magistrates, taking hold of the hands of the most iniquitous servant, found the iron ring and compared it with the seal of the bag, which comparison corroborated the preceding suspicion. Nor were the wheel and the rack called Aquilius wanting, prepared for the purpose of tormenting him, after the manner of the Greeks. But he, being strengthened by a wonderful audacity, did not succumb to any blows, nor even the fire itself. Then the physician said, I will not suffer by Hercules, I will not suffer, either that you should punish that innocent young man unjustly, or that this fellow should escape the punishment of his nefarious deed, our judgment being frustrated. For I will give you an evident proof of the present affair. When this most abandoned man was anxious to procure the deadly poison, but I did not think it accorded with my art to administer to any one the causes of death, having learnt that medicine was not sought after for the destruction but for the preservation of men, fearing lest if I refused to give it to him I should open for him a path to wickedness by an unseasonable repulse, and that he would accomplish the nefarious design he had begun, either by buying a deadly potion from some other person, or, lastly, by the sword or some different weapon. Fearing this, I gave him not poison, but a preparation of that somniferous plant mandrake, famous for the torpor which it occasions, and which produces a sleep most similar to death. Nor is it wonderful that this most desperate knave, being certain of suffering the extreme punishment which must befall him conformably to the custom of our ancestors, should easily endure these torments as things of a lighter nature. But if the boy has really taken the potion which was tempered by my hands, he still lives, is in a quiescent state, and sleeps, and immediately on the oppressive sleep being dissipated he will return to the lucid day. But if he has truly perished, if he is truly overtaken by death, you may from other sources investigate the causes of his destruction. The old man, having thus addressed the senators, they assented to what he said, and immediately proceeded with great haste to that sepulchre, in which the body of the boy was deposited. There was not any one of the senate, nor any one among those of the first rank, that did not run thither impelled by curiosity. And behold, the father himself, having with his own hands removed the lid of the coffin, found his son rising from death, the deadly sleep being just then dissipated. And having most closely embraced him, and not being able to express in words his present joy, he led him forth to the people, and the boy was brought into court in the condition in which he still was bound and wrapped in funeral garments. Now, likewise, the naked truth was obvious to every one, the wickedness being manifested of the most iniquitous servant, and of the still more abandoned woman. And the stepmother, indeed, was condemned to perpetual exile, but the servant was hanged, and by the consent of all, the golden solidi were given to the good physician, as the reward of the opportune sleep which he had procured. Thus the famous and fabulous fortune of that old man received a termination worthy the providence of the gods, since, in a slender moment, or rather in the smallest point of time, he suddenly became the father of two young men, after he had been in danger of losing both. But I, at that time, was rolled about by such tempestuous waves of fate as the following. That soldier who brought me without any one selling me, and who made me his own without price, paying due obedience to the mandate of his tribute, being about to carry letters to the great prince, which is to say to the emperor, towards Rome, sold me for eleven pence to two servants in the neighborhood who were brothers. The master of these was a very opulent man, but one of them was a confectioner who made bread and eatables tempered with honey, and the other was a cook, who by the assistance of heat made minced meat seasoned with the sweetest juices of bruised herbs and aromatics. These two, dwelling together, lived in common, and bought me for the purpose of carrying those numerous vessels which were necessary to their masters for various uses, 
when they traveled through many regions. I was taken, therefore, as a third companion with those, not having at any time of my transformation experienced a fortune so benevolent. For in the evening, after most sumptuous suppers, and the most splendid apparatus of them, my masters were accustomed to take into their own little room many fragments. One of them, the most ample remains of pigs, chickens, fishes, and mincemeat of every kind, but the other, bread, pastry, spice cakes, tarts in the shapes of hooks and lizards, and many honeyed sweetmeats. When these two, having fastened the door of their chamber, went to the baths for the sake of refreshing themselves, I abundantly feasted myself on the dainties which were offered to me through the favor of the gods. For I was not so stupid and so truly an ass as to eat very hard and rough hay, neglecting that most delicious food. And for a long time, indeed, the artifice of my theft succeeded most beautifully, because as yet I stole timidly, and in a sufficiently sparing manner, a few things out of so many, and they did not suspect any fraud in an ass. But when becoming still more confident of concealment, I devoured the most exquisite fragments, and, rejecting the more rancid, began to eat the sweeter morsels. No small suspicion stimulated the minds of the brothers. And though they did not then believe any such thing of me, nevertheless they diligently investigated the author of their daily loss. At length, also, they accused each other of that most disgraceful rapine, and now they bestowed greater care and a more vigilant observation, and counted the fragments. At length, being no longer restrained by bashfulness, one of them thus addressed the other. It is neither equitable nor courteous that you should daily purloin the choicest parts, and by selling them, latently increase your wealth, and yet contend for an equal division of what remains. For in short, if our partnership is displeasing to you, we may indeed remain brothers, so far as pertains to everything else, and yet depart from this bond of communion. For I see that complaint of the loss, proceeding to infinity, nourishes very great discord between us. To this the other replied, I also, by Hercules, applaud your perseverance, that after you have daily and secretly stolen fragments, you have prevented the complaint, which I have for a long time silently and sorrowfully retained, lest I should seem to accuse my brother of sordid rapine. But it is well that by speaking to each other we seek a remedy for our loss, lest our dissembled hatred increasing by silence should excite in us Ateoclean contentions. After these and other similar reproaches arising from their mutual altercation, they both of them swore that they had not committed any fraud nor any theft, but agreed that they ought by all possible means to search after the thief who was the cause of their common loss. For they said, it was not possible that the ass, which alone was present, could be delighted with such kind of food, and yet the choicest portions of it were daily not to be found. They added that neither did flies so large as were the harpies of old, who took away by violence the foods of Phineas, wing their way into their apartment. In the meantime, I, being largely fed with dainty morsels and abundantly satisfied with human food, filled my body with gross fat, rendered my hide soft with succulent suet, and nourished my hairs with a liberal neatness. But that gracefulness of my body produced a great disgrace to my modesty, for they being excited to suspicion by the unusual distension of my hide, and perceiving that my hay remained daily untouched, they now directed all their attention to me, and having as usual shut the doors at the accustomed hour, as if they were going to the baths, they beheld me through a certain small chink, intently eating the fragments which were everywhere exposed. Now, therefore, laying aside all concern for their loss, they burst into a loud laugh, admiring the monstrous delicacies of an ass, and having called many of their fellow-servants, they pointed out to them the veracity of a sluggish ass, a thing horrible to relate. At length laughter so great and so unrestrained seized on all of them that it also reached the ears of the master who was passing that way. He, therefore, inquiring what good had occurred to make his servants laugh so excessively, and having learnt what the affair was, he, likewise, looking through the same chink, was extremely delighted. And afterwards, he also breaking out into laughter so unrestrained as to cause pain in his intestines, and having opened the door of the chamber, came nearer to me, and considered me more attentively. For I, beholding the countenance of fortune, in a certain respect, smiling more propitiously upon me, continued eating tranquilly, not in the least disturbed, the joy of those that were present afforded me confidence, till the master of the house, being exhilarated by the novelty of this spectacle, ordered me to be led to the supper-room, or rather he brought me to it with his own hands, and the table being furnished, he directed every kind of solid food to be placed before me, and such delicacies as had not been touched. But I, though I was well crammed, yet desiring to render myself more acceptable and more commendable to him, ate as if I had been hungry of the food that was placed before me. For they, prompted by curiosity, thinking of everything which an ass mostly abhors, offered it to me, for the purpose of exploring my mildness, such as flesh seasoned with the juice of the herb masterwort, birds sprinkled over with pepper, 
and fish that had been pickled. In the meantime, the banquet resounded with excessive laughter. End of chapter 10, part 1「Chapter Ten, Part Two of the Metamorphosis or Golden Ass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tim Ferreira. The Metamorphosis or Golden Ass by Apuleius. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter Ten, Part Two. At length, a certain buffoon who was present said, Give some wine to this guest to which the master assenting answered, Knave, you have not spoken absurdly, for it is very possible that our comrade will also willingly drink a cup of mead. And he said, Come hither, boy, wash well that golden cup, fill it with mead and offer it to my parasite, and at the same time admonish him that I have previously drank to him. After this, the great expectation was exciting among the guests. Nevertheless, I, not being at all disturbed, drank at one draught all that was contained in that most capacious cup, leisurely and in a sufficiently pleasant manner, incurvating the extremity of my lip in the shape of a tongue. A clamor was raised, through all of them, with one according voice, drinking my health. Lastly, the master, being excessively joyful, and having called the servants that bought me, ordered that four times the sum which they paid for me should be given to them, and he delivered me to a certain person who had been his slave, but was now manumitted, to whom he was very much attached, and who was very rich, and desired him to pay me every requisite attention. This man nourished me in a sufficiently humane and kind manner, and, that he might render himself more acceptable to his patron, most studiously furnished him with delight through my pleasantry. And, in the first place, indeed, he taught me to sit down at table, leaning on my elbow, afterwards to wrestle and to dance, my forefeet being elevated, and, which was especially admirable, to use signs instead of words, so that I could indicate what I wished by raising, and what I did not wish by declining my head. He also taught me, when I was thirsty, to look at the cup-bearer, and to ask for drink by alternately closing my eyes. And to all these things I was very readily obedient, which, indeed, I should have done, though no one had shown me how to do them. But I was fearful, lest, if I should happen to perform them, after the manner of men, without a master, most would think it portended sinister events, and that I, as a monster and prodigy, should lose my head and be given for fat provender to vultures. And now my fame was spread abroad publicly, by which I rendered my master illustrious and famous, through my wonderful arts. This, said the people, is the man who has an ass for his guest and associate, an ass that wrestles and dances, that jests and understands the language of men, and indicates what it means by nods. It is now, however, requisite that I should inform you, though I ought to have done it in the beginning, who that Tiasus was, or whence he originated, for this was the name of my master. The country in which he was born was Corinth which city ranks as the chief of all the province of Achaea, and, as he had gradually obtained all the honors which his pedigree and dignity demanded, he had been appointed to the office of quinquennial magistrate. In order, therefore, that he might act conformably to the splendor of that office, he had promised that he would exhibit, during the space of three days, the spectacle of prize-fighting, but he had still more amply extended his munificence. Lastly, he had then also come to Thessaly, through the desire of public glory, in order to procure from thence the most noble wild beasts and famous gladiators. And now, having bought and disposed of everything according to his wish, he was preparing to return home. Despising, however, his own most splendid chariots, and undervaluing his beautiful coaches and wagons, which were drawn along empty at the extremity of his train, some of them being covered and others open, neglecting also the Thessalonian horses and his other Gallic laboring beasts, by which a generous offspring bears testimony to the precious dignity of its origin. Despising and neglecting all these, he rode most lovingly on me, who was decorated with golden trappings, dyed saddles, purpled coverings, silver bridles, painted girths, and very sonorous little bells, and sometimes he spoke to me in the most courteous language. Among many other things also which he said, he professed to be in the highest degree delighted that he possessed in me at one and the same time a companion and a carrier. But when, having finished our journey, partly by land and partly by sea, we came to Corinth, a great crowd of citizens ran to meet us, not so much for the purpose of doing honor to Tiasus, as from a desire of seeing me, for so great a rumor had pervaded that city about me that I was the source of no small gain to my governor, who, when he perceived many longings with great desire to see my sports, he shut the door and introduced each of them separately, having first received money from them, by which means he was accustomed daily to collect no small sums. In that assembly there was a certain matron, powerful and opulent, who, after the manner of the rest, 
having purchased a sight of me, and from thenceforth was delighted with my multiform pastimes, fell, at length, gradually, through her continual admiration into a wonderful desire of enjoying me, and, not applying any remedy to her insane lust, ardently waited for my embraces, like an asinine pacifii. At length she prevailed on my keeper, for a great sum of money, to let me lie with her for one night. But that knave, in order that he might drive advantage from me, being only satisfied with his own gain, assented. And now, the laborious and wakeful night being finished, the woman withdrew from my embraces, avoiding the conscious testimony of the light, and making a contract with my keeper for some future night, at the same price. Nor did he unwillingly accede to her voluptuous desires, partly induced by the very ample reward which he received from her, and partly through the opportunity afforded him of preparing a new spectacle for his lord, to whom, without delay, he unfolded the whole scene of our lust. But he, having magnificently rewarded his manumitted servant, destined me to be shown in public, and, because that egregious wife of mine could not be publicly connected with me, on account of her dignity, nor any other could be found for the same purpose, a certain vile woman, who had been sentenced by the prefect to be devoured by wild beasts, was procured, for a great sum of money, to have connection with me in the enclosure of the theatre, in the sight of all the spectators. Of this woman I have heard the following history. She had a husband, a young man, whose father, undertaking a journey, ordered his wife, who was the mother of that same young man, in whom he left oppressed with the burden of pregnancy, that if she brought forth an infant of the inferior sex, she should immediately cause that of which was delivered to be slain. But she, during the absence of her husband, having brought forth a girl, and being moved by the pious affection naturally inherent in a mother, revolted from the mandate of her husband, and delivered it to be nourished by one of her neighbors. Her husband also now having returned, she told him that she had been delivered of a daughter, and that she was destroyed. But as soon as the flower of age required a nuptial day should be appointed for the virgin, and as she could not give a dowry suitable to the parentage of her daughter, unknown to her husband, she did that which she could alone do. Namely, she unfolded the secret to her son, which had hitherto been concealed in silence. For she was very much afraid, lest he, by some accident, erring through the impulse of juvenile ardor, should ignorantly have connection with his sister, who also was ignorant that he was her brother. But this young man, who was remarkably pious, and who religiously obeyed the mandates of his mother, and performed the duties due to his sister, delivered the arcana of his house to the custody of venerable silence, exhibiting only by his countenance a vulgar benevolence toward his sister. And he undertook in such a way to perform the necessary duty of consanguinity that he received her into the protection of her own house, as if she had been some desolate neighboring virgin, and deprived of the guardian care of her parents. And soon after he placed her with a certain most dear associate of his, and most liberally bestowed on her a dowry from his own property. But these things being well disposed, and in the best manner, and with all sanctity, could not escape the deadly knot of fortune, by whose impulse a cruel rivalship immediately directed its course to the house of the young man. And the same wife of his, who now was condemned to wild beasts for these very crimes, began first to entertain a suspicion of the girl, as the rival of her bed, and a harlot. In the next place to defeat her, and in the third place to contrive the most cruel snares for her destruction. In the last place she devised the following wicked stratagem. Having stolen the ring of her husband, she went into the country, and from thence sent a servant who was faithful indeed to her, but perfectly hostile to fidelity herself, and told him to inform the girl that the young man was gone to her village, and desired her to come to him, and added that she was to go alone, with all possible celerity, and without any attendant. And, lest any doubt should happen to arise in her mind about the propriety of going, she delivered to him the ring which she had taken from her husband, which, being shown, would give credibility to his words. But she, complying with the mandate of her brother, for she alone knew that he was her brother, and having also inspected his seal which was shown to her, strenuously hastened to go unattended as she was desired to do. As soon, however, as through the deception of extreme fraud she fell into the snares which were prepared for her, then that egregious wife, being insanely excited by the stimulus of libidinous fury, in the first place indeed having stripped her naked, whipped her even to the extremity of torment, and afterwards, though she explained the things it really was, and also exclaimed, that she in vain boiled over with indignation, through conceiving her to be a harlot, and frequently repeated the name of her brother, she slew her by thrusting a burning torch into her private parts, as if she had lied and invented all that she had told her. Then the brother and her husband, being excited by the news of her cruel death, flew to her, and having mourned the fate of the girl with various lamentations, committed her to the grave. Nor could the young man endure with equanimity such a miserable death of his sister, by her by whom it was by no means equitable it should have been occasioned, but, being most profoundly grieved and wholly possessed by the noxious fury of the most vehement bile, he began from that time to burn with a raging fever, 
so that for him also a remedy seemed to be necessary. But his wife, who some time ago had lost the name, together with the fidelity of a wife, went to a certain physician well known for his perfidy, who, being famous for his victories in many contests, could enumerate great trophies which his right hand had obtained, and immediately promised him fifty sestertia, in order that he, indeed, might sell poison so efficacious as to destroy in a moment, but that she might buy the death of her husband. This being done, she and the physician pretended that the most excellent potion which they had brought, and which the more learned call sacred, was necessary for mitigating pains of the viscera, and carrying off the bile. But, in its stead, they substituted a potion sacred to the health of proserpine. And now the physician extended to the sick man with his own hand, the well-tempered cup, his own family and some of his friends and kindred being present. But that audacious woman, in order that she might destroy the physician, the partner of her guilt, and at the same time be enriched by the money which she had promised, retaining the cup in the sight of all of them, said, O best of physicians, you shall not give this potion to my most dear husband till you have drank a good part of it yourself, for how do I know whether a noxious poison may not be concealed in it? And this is a thing which should by no means offend you, who are a man so prudent and learned, that I, as a religious wife, being solicitous for the safety of my husband, perform a necessary duty of piety. The physician, being suddenly agitated by the desperate audacity of the cruel woman, and totally deprived of all counsel and of every opportunity of thinking, through the shortness of the time, drank largely of the potion, before he had raised any suspicion of his evil conscience by any trepidation or delay. And the young man, following his example, took the cup and drank what was offered to him. The present business being thus transacted, the physician prepared to return home with the greatest celerity, in order that he might extinguish the deadly power of the poison which he had taken by a salutiferous potion. But the barbarous woman, persisting in the same sacrilegious obstinacy as that which she had adopted from the first, would not suffer him to depart from her the breadth of a nail, till, as she said, the effect of the medicine was evidently proved, in consequence of the potion being distributed through the whole body. But being much, and for a long time wearied by his prayers and earnest entreaties, she at length scarcely permitted him to depart. In the meantime his most inward parts attracted the occult destruction which raged through all his viscera, and, at last, he with great difficulty came to his own house very ill and now oppressed with a somnolent heaviness. Scarcely also being able to narrate every particular, he ordered his wife to demand at least the promised reward of a double death. And thus that most illustrious physician, being destroyed by violence, gave up the ghost. Nor did that young man live any longer than the physician, but perished by a similar kind of death, amidst the fictitious and false tears of his wife. And he, being now buried after a few days, had intervened, during which funeral rites are performed to the dead, the wife of the physician came and demanded the money which was due for the double death. But the woman, always like herself, overpowering the real form of fidelity and exhibiting only its image, mildly answered her and promised everything liberally and abundantly, and agreed to pay the stipulated sum without delay, only adding that she wished she could give her a little of that potion for the purpose of accomplishing the business she had begun. This the wife of the physician, inveigled by the many snares of the most wicked frauds, readily consented to do, and, that she might render herself more acceptable to the opulent woman, hastily returned home and immediately afterwards delivered her the whole box of poison. Having therefore now obtained the grand instrument of wickedness, she extended far and wide her sanguinary hands. She had a little daughter by the husband whom she had lately killed, and she was very indignant that the laws would necessarily give to this little one the inheritance of her father. Greedily desiring also the whole patrimony of her daughter, she waited only for an opportunity of destroying her. Being certain, therefore, that mothers received the immature inheritances of their deceased children, she showed herself to be such a parent as she had proved herself to be a wife, and pretending to prepare a dinner, in consequence of a circumstance that had occurred, she attacked with the same poison both the wife of the physician and her own daughter. But that deadly venom immediately consumed the slender life and delicate and tender viscera of the little girl. The wife of the physician, however, while the tempest of the detestable potion wandered through her lungs with its noxious windings, first suspecting what the thing was, and afterwards, through the oppression of her breath, being now more certain that her suspicion was right, went to the house of the prefect of the province, and, with a great clamor, imploring his assistance, a tumult of the people also being excited, in consequence of the disclosure she was about to make of such barbarous wickedness, she occasioned both the house and the ears of the prefect to be immediately opened. And now, having accurately narrated all the atrocities of this most cruel woman from the beginning, being suddenly seized with a dark vertigo of the mind, she compressed her lips, which were still half open, and having for a long time produced a crashing noise by the gnashing of her teeth, 
she fell lifeless before the feet of the prefect. But he, though he was a man accustomed to things of this kind, would not suffer the multiform wickedness of this execrable sorceress to flag by a languid delay, but immediately ordered the chambermaids of the woman to be brought before him, and by the force of torments exhorted from them the truth. He also sentenced her to a punishment which was indeed less than she deserved, namely that she should be cast to wild beasts, because he could not find any other torment so adapted to the enormity of her guilt. With such a woman as this it was determined that I should be publicly connected, as if I had been lawfully married to her. And, being very much vexed, I waited with great anxiety for the day of the spectacle, being frequently willing to destroy myself with my own hand, rather than be defiled by coming into contact with such an abandoned woman, or be defamed by the disgrace of a public spectacle. But, as I was deprived of human hands, and was also destitute of fingers, I could by no means draw a sword with my round and imperfect hoof. However, I consoled myself, in my extreme misery, with a slender hope, because, the spring now beginning to appear, would paint everything with florid buds, and would now clothe the meadows with a purple splendor, and roses would then burst forth, exhaling the sweetest odors, which would restore me to my former Lucius, which is to say, my pristine form. Behold, the day destined to the spectacle was present, and I was led into the arena, the people following me with triumphant applause. And while the beginning of the spectacle was dedicated to the sportive dances of the players, I, in the meantime, being placed before the gate, gladly fed on the very flourishing grass which germinated at the entrance, now and then also refreshing my inquisitive eyes with the most agreeable prospect of the spectacle, because the gate was open. For boys and virgins flourishing in florid youth, conspicuous for their beauty, in splendid garments, acting as they walked, dancing the Greek Pyrrhic dance, and disposed in rank, performed graceful circuits, now turning round in an orb like a wheel, now connected by their hands in an oblique order, and afterwards being disposed into the form of a wedge with a square aperture, and then becoming separated into two troops. But after the clangor of the terminating trumpet had dissolved the manifold circuits of the reciprocal movements, the hangings being removed and the curtains folded, a representation of the fable of Paris was prepared, as follows. There was a wooden mountain made in imitation of that celebrated mountain which Homer calls Ida. This was of a lofty structure, was planted with grass plats and living trees, and from its highest top emitted river water, from a fountain flowing through the contrivance of the artist. A few goats cropped the grass, and a certain young man, excellently clothed with barbaric vestments, dependent from his shoulders, and having his head covered with golden tiara after the manner of the Phrygian shepherd Paris, pretended to be skilled in the pastoral discipline. A beautiful boy also was present naked, except that a robe adapted to a child covered his left shoulder. This boy was every way conspicuous for his yellow hair, among which little golden wings associated by a similar alliance were prominent, and the caduceus and the wand indicated that the boy was Mercury. He, running with a dancing motion, and carrying in his right hand an apple gilt with spangles, extended it to him who represented Paris, and announced to him by signs the mandate of Jupiter. Immediately after, elegantly receding, he departed from the view. A girl succeeded, of a beautiful face, and resembling the goddess Juno, for her head was begirt with a white diadem, and she also carried a scepter. Another virgin entered, whom you might believe to be Minerva, having her head covered with a fulgid helmet, and the helmet itself was covered with an olive-colored crown. She also lifted up a shield, which is to say the Aegis, and shook a spear, and appeared to be such as she is when she fights. After these another female entered, of surpassing beauty, representing Venus by the decoration of her divine color and such as Venus was when she was a virgin, exhibiting perfect beauty in a body naked and uncovered, except that her private parts were inumbrated by a thin silken garment, the fringe of which the busy wind, in a sufficiently amorous manner, now wantonly blew back, that, being removed, the flower of her age might be manifest, and now luxuriantly blew upon that, by close adherence, the pleasure which the members, the private parts, were formed to give might be delineated. But the color itself of the goddess was various to the view, for her body was white because she descended from heaven, and her silken garment was azure because she emerged from the sea. And now the several virgins who represented goddesses were surrounded by their attendants, Juno indeed by Castor and Pollux, whose heads were covered with round helmets, conspicuous by the stars which glittered on their summits. But these representatives of the twin brothers were young actors. This virgin, Juno, proceeding with a tranquil and unaffected gesticulation, conformably to the various modulations of the wantonly sounding flute, promised the shepherd, by modest signs, that she would bestow on him the empire of all Asia if he had judged to her the palm of beauty. But two boys, who represented terror and fear, the armor-bearing attendants of the warlike goddess, dancing with drawn swords, surrounded that virgin who, by the arms with which she was adorned, represented Minerva. 
and a piper who was behind her played a dorian which is to say a warlike tune and mingling sharp tinkling with flat sounds excited the vigor of brisk dancing after the manner of a trumpet this girl by tossing her head looking with threatening eyes and walking with a quick and intorted step signified to paris by her cheerful gesticulation that if he gave to her the victory of beauty he should become through her assistance brave and illustrious by the trophies of war then venus stood gracefully in the very middle of the scene sweetly smiling accompanied by the great applause of the spectators and surrounded by a crowd of rejoicing boys you would say that those smooth and fair boys were cupids and real cupids who had just then descended from heaven or emerged from the sea for they admirably resembled them by their small wings their little arrows and the rest of their external habiliments they also bore splendid torches before their mistress as if she had been going to some nuptial banquet unmarried girls likewise a graceful progeny were there assembled here the most pleasing graces there the most beautiful hours who rendering their goddess propitious by throwing flowers made into garlands or loose form the most elegant choir and soothe the goddess of pleasure with the hair of the spring now pipes with many perforations sweetly send forth lydian modulations and while they delightfully allure the minds of the spectators venus in a far more delectable manner began placidly to move herself and to proceed with a gentle and slow step the spine of her back at the same time lightly undulating and her head gradually moving and thus she conformed her delicate gestures to the soft sound of the pipes at one time also she gently winked and at another sharply threatened with her eyes and sometimes danced with them alone this girl, as soon as she came into the presence of the judge, which is to say of the scenic Paris, seemed to promise by the motion of her arms that she would give to Paris a wife of surpassing beauty, Helen, and like herself if he would prefer her to the other goddesses. Then the Phrygian young man delivered with a willing mind to the girl the golden apple which he held in his hands as an indication that she had conquered. Why, therefore, do you wonder, O most vile heads, or rather forensic cattle, or still more properly gowned vultures, if all judges now sell their decisions for money? For even in the most remote periods of antiquity, favor could corrupt the judgment which was agitated between gods and men, and a young man who was a rustic and a shepherd, being elected a judge by the decision of the great Jupiter, sold the first judicial decision for the lucre of lust, accompanied likewise by the destruction of all his race. Thus also by Hercules another judgment posterior to this was given between the illustrious leaders of the Greeks, either when Palamedes, who excelled in erudition and science, was condemned by false accusations as a traitor, or when the mendicant Ulysses was preferred to the mighty Ajax, who was preeminent in military prowess. And of what kind was that judgment which was the decision of the law-giving Athenians, who were a wise people and the master of all science? Was not that divinely prudent old man Socrates, whom the Delphic god preferred for his wisdom to all mortals, circumvented by the fraud and envy of a most iniquitous faction, as if he had been a corrupter of youth, though he restrained them as with a bridle, was not he destroyed by the noxious juice of a pestilent herb, leaving to his fellow citizens the stain of perpetual infamy? Since even now the most excellent philosophers choose his most holy sect before all others, and swear in his name for the greatest and most earnest desire of beatitude. Lest, however, someone should blame this impetus of my indignation, thus thinking with himself, Behold now, shall we suffer an ass to philosophize to us? I shall again return to the narration from whence I digressed. After that judgment of Paris was finished, Juno, indeed, and Minerva departed from the theatre, sad and enraged, and showed by their gestures the indignation which they felt from being rejected. But Venus, full of joy and hilarity, exhibited her gladness by dancing with all her choir. Then wine, mixed with crocus, burst forth on high from the summit of the mountain, through a certain latent tube, and flowing in scattered streams sprinkled as it fell, and an odoriferous shower, the goats that fed round it till being dyed into a better form, they changed their proper whiteness into a saffron color. And now, the whole theatre exhaling a sweet odour, a gulf of the earth absorbed that wooden mountain. When, behold, a certain soldier ran through the middle of the street in order to bring, to the people now demanding it, that woman from the public prison, who, as I have said, was condemned to wild beasts on account of her multiform wickedness, and detained to be my illustrious bride. What was intended also to be our genial bed could be most distinctly seen, for it was transparent, being made from the Indian tortoise, was tumid with a plumous heap, and floored with a silken coverlet. But I, besides the shame of being publicly connected, and besides the contagion of a wicked and polluted woman, was also in the highest degree tormented with the fear of death, thus thinking with myself, that in the venereal embrace, while we were adhering to each other, whatever wild beast should be sent in to the destruction of the woman, it would not be so prudent and sagacious, or so tutored by art, 
or so frugal and temperate as to lacerate the woman who was placed by my side and spare me as one uncondemned and innoxious. Being therefore solicitous, not for my modesty, but for my life, while liberty was granted to me of indulging my own thoughts, my master being intent on aptly preparing the bed, and all his servants being partly occupied in hunting, and partly attentive to the voluptuous spectacle, no one believing that so mild an ass required to be so attentively guarded, I gradually withdrew myself by an occult flight. And when I arrived at the next gate, I hurried away with most rapid steps. When also, with great celerity, I had travelled over six thousand entire paces, I arrived at Kentria, which city, indeed, is said to be the most noble economy of the Corinthians. But it is contiguous to the Aegean and Saronic Sea, where also there is a port, which is a most safe receptacle for ships, and is very populous. Avoiding, therefore, the crowd, and choosing the solitary shore, near to the erectation of the waves, there, stretched on a most soft bed of sand, I refreshed my weary body. For the chariot of the sun had declined to the last boundary of day, and sweet sleep overpowered me, when I gave myself to the evening repose. End of chapter 10, part 2「Chapter Eleven, Part One of the Metamorphosis or Golden Ass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Albrecht. The Metamorphosis or Golden Ass by Apuleius. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter Eleven, Part One. Being awakened with a sudden terror about the first watch of the night, I beheld the full orb of the moon shining with excessive brightness, and just then emerging from the waves of the sea. Availing myself, therefore, of the silent secrets of opaque night, as I was also well assured that the primary goddess possessed a transcendent majesty, and that human affairs were entirely governed by her providence, and that not only cattle and wild beasts, but likewise things inanimate, were invigorated by the divine power of her light and of her deity, that the bodies likewise which are in the earth, in the heavens, and in the sea, are at one time increased as she increases, and at another time, conformably to her decrements, are diminished. Being well assured of this, I determined to implore the august image of the goddess then present, fate being now satiated with my calamities so many and so great, and administering to me the hope of safety, though late. Having, therefore, immediately shaken off sluggish sleep, I rose promptly and cheerfully, and directly applied myself to purification by washing with marine water, and having merged my head seven times in the waves, because according to the divine Pythagoras that number is especially adapted to religious purposes, I joyfully and readily thus supplicated with a weeping countenance the transcendently powerful goddess, Queen of Heaven, whether thou art pure and nourishing Ceres, the original parent of fruits, who rejoicing for the discovery of thy daughter didst banish the savage nutriment of the ancient acorn, and exhibiting a milder aliment, dost now dwell in the Illusian land, or whether thou art celestial Venus, who in the first origin of things didst associate the different sexes through the intervention of mutual love, and having propagated an eternal progeny from the human race, art now worshipped in Paphos, which is washed by the surrounding sea? Or whether thou art the sister of Phoebus, who by relieving the pains of parturient women by lenient remedies, hast delivered into light such a numerous multitude of men, and art now venerated in the illustrious temple of Ephesus? Or whether thou art Proserpine, terrific by nocturnal howlings, restraining with a triform face the assaults of spectres, closing the recesses of the earth, wandering through various groves and propitiated by different modes of worship, with that female light of thine, illuminating every city and with moist fires nourishing the joyful seeds of plants and through the revolutions of the sun, dispensing uncertain light, by whatever name, by whatever rites, and under whatever form it is lawful to invoke thee, graciously succour me in this my extreme calamity, support my fallen fortune, and grant me rest and peace after the endurance of so many cruel misfortunes. Let there have been enough of labours, let there have been enough of dangers. Remove from me the dire form of a quadruped, restore me to the sight of my kindred, restore me to my Lucius, 
and if any offended deity oppresses me with inexorable cruelty, may it at least be lawful for me to die, if it is not lawful for me to live. Having after this manner poured forth my prayers, accompanied by miserable lamentations, sleep surrounding me again oppressed my merced mind in the same bed, and scarcely had I closed my eyes when, behold, I saw in a dream a divine form emerging from the middle of the sea, and raising a countenance venerable even to the gods themselves. Afterwards the whole of the most splendid image seemed to stand before me, having gradually shaken off the sea. But I will also endeavour to explain to you its admirable form, if the poverty of human language will but afford me the power of an appropriate narration, or if the divinity itself of the most luminous form will supply me with a liberal abundance of fluent diction. In the first place, then, her most copious and long hairs, being gradually entorted and promiscuously scattered on her divine neck, were softly defluous. A multiform crown, consisting of various flowers, bound the sublime summit of her head. And in the middle of the crown, just on her forehead, there was a smooth orb resembling a mirror, or rather a white, refulgent light, which indicated that she was the moon. Vipers rising up after the manner of furrows environed the crown on the right hand and on the left, and cerulean ears of corn were also extended from above. Her garment was of many colours and woven from the finest flax, and was at one time lucid with a white splendour, at another yellow from the flower of crocus, and at another flaming with a rosy redness. But that which most excessively dazzled my sight was a very black robe, fulgid with a dark splendour, and which spreading round and passing under her right side, and ascending to her left shoulder, there rose protuberant like the centre of a shield, the dependent part of the robe falling in many folds, and having small knots of fringe gracefully flowing in its extremities. Glittering stars were dispersed through the embroidered border of the robe, and through the whole of its surface, and the full moon, shining in the middle of the stars, breathed forth flaming fires. Nevertheless, a crown, wholly consisting of flowers and fruits of every kind, adhered with indivisible connection to the border of that conspicuous robe in all its undulating motions. What she carried in her hands also consisted of things of a very different nature. For her right hand, indeed, bore a brazen rattle, through the narrow lamina of which, bent like a belt, certain rods passing, produced a sharp triple sound through the vibrating motion of her arm. An oblong vessel, in the shape of a boat, depended from her left hand, on the handle of which, in that part in which it was conspicuous, an asp raised its erect head and largely swelling neck, and shoes woven from the leaves of the victorious palm tree covered her immortal feet. Such and so great a goddess, breathing the fragrant odour of the shoots of Arabia the happy, deigned with a divine voice thus to address me. Behold, Lucius, I who am moved by thy prayers am present with thee, I, who am nature, the parent of things, the queen of all the elements, the primordial progeny of ages, the supreme of divinities, the sovereign of the spirits of the dead, the first of the celestials, and the uniform resemblance of gods and goddesses. I, who rule by my nod the luminous summits of the heavens, the salubrious breezes of the sea, and the deplorable silences of the realms beneath, and whose one divinity the whole orb of the earth venerates under a manifold form, by different rites and a variety of appellations. Hence the primogenial Phrygians call me Pesenuctica, the mother of the gods, the Attic Aborigines Cecropian Minerva, the floating Cyprians Faphian Venus, the arrow-bearing Cretans Diana Dictina, the three-tongued Sicilians, Stygian Porserpini, and the Eleusinians, the ancient goddess Ceres. Some also call me Juno, others Bellona, others Hecate, and others Ramnusia. And those who are illuminated by the incipient rays of that divinity, the sun, when he rises, these the Ethiopians, 
the arii and the egyptians skilled in ancient learning worshipping me by ceremonies perfectly appropriate call me by my true name queen isis behold then i commiserating thy calamities am present now through my providence favouring and propitious dismiss now tears and lamentations and expel sorrow now through my providence the salutary day will shine upon thee listen therefore attentively to these my mandates the religion which is eternal has consecrated to me the day which will be born from this night on which day my priests offer to me the first fruits of navigation dedicating to me a new ship when now the winter tempests are mitigated and the stormy waves of the deep are appeased and the sea itself has now become navigable that sacred ceremony you ought to expect with a mind neither solicitous nor profane for the priest being admonished by me shall bear a rosy crown in his right hand adhering to the rattle in the very procinct of the pomp without delay therefore cheerfully follow the procession when the crowd is dispersed confiding in my benevolence when also you approach the priest gently pluck the roses as if you intended to kiss his hand and immediately divest yourself of the hide of that worst of beasts and which for some time since has been to me detestable nor should you fear anything pertaining to my concerns as difficult for in this very same moment of time in which i come to you being there also present i order my priest in a dream to do those things which are to be done hereafter by my command the thick crowd of people shall afford you room to pass through them nor amidst the joyful ceremonies and festive spectacles shall any one abhor that deformed figure which you bear or malignantly accuse you by putting a sinister construction on the sudden change of your form only remember and always retain it deposited in the penetralia of your mind that the remaining course of your life must be dedicated to me even to the boundaries of your last breath nor is it unjust that you should owe your whole life to that goddess by whose assistance you will return to the human form but you will live happy you will live glorious under my protection and when having passed through the allotted space of your life you descend to the realms beneath there also in the subterranean hemisphere you dwelling in the elysian fields shall frequently adore me whom you now see and shall there behold me shining amidst the darkness of acheron reigning in the stygian penetralia and being propitious to you moreover if you shall be found to deserve the protection of my divinity by sedulous obedience religious services and inviolable chastity you shall know that it is possible for me alone to extend your life beyond the limits appointed to it by your fate the venerable oracle being thus finished the invincible goddess receded into herself and without delay i being liberated from sleep immediately arose seized with fear and joy and in an excessive perspiration and in the highest degree admiring so manifest an appearance of the powerful goddess having sprinkled myself with marine dew and intent on her great commands i revolved in my mind the order of her mandates shortly after too the golden sun arose and put to flight the darkness of black night when behold a crowd of people filled all the streets with a religious and perfectly triumphant procession all things likewise independent of my peculiar joy seemed to me to exult with such great hilarity that i might have thought that cattle of every kind every house and even the day itself rejoiced with a serene countenance for a bright and placid day suddenly succeeded to the frost of the preceding day so that the tuneful birds also sang sweetly allured by the tepid heat of the spring and with bland warbling soothed the mother of the stars the parent of the ages and the mistress of the whole world the very trees likewise both those which were prolific with fruit and those which were barren and only offered a shade being relaxed by the southern breezes and delighted with the germination of their leaves produced through the gentle motion of the branches sweetly whistling sounds and the sea the loud crashing noise of its storms being appeased and the turbid swelling of its waves having subsided softly washed the shore 
but the heavens the cloudy darkness being dispersed were bright with the clear and serene splendor of their own proper light behold then the preludes of the great pomp gradually proceeded beautifully adorned conformably to the votive diligence of every one concerned in the procession this man being girded with a belt represented a soldier that being clothed with a short cloak and carrying scimitars and javelins was adorned like a hunter another having golden socks on his feet being clothed with a silken garment and precious female ornaments and with false hair on his head assumed the appearance of a woman by his gliding step but another was remarkable by his boots his shield his helmet and his sword and you would have thought that he came from the school of the gladiators nor was there wanting one who represented a magistrate by the fasces and the purple vests nor one who feigned himself to be a philosopher by his cloak his staff and his slippers and his goatish beard nor those who with dissimilar reeds represented the one a fowler with bird lime the other a fisherman with his hook i also saw a tame bear which was carried on a bench in a matronal dress and an ape with a woven hat on its head and clothed with a phrygian garment of a saffron colour carrying in its hand a golden cup and representing the shepherd ganymede and likewise an ass to which wings were agglutinated and which walked near to a certain old man so that you would have said the one was bellerophon and the other pegasus and nevertheless you would have laughed at both during these ridiculous amusements of the people who wandered about everywhere the peculiar pomp of the saviour goddess advanced women splendid in white garments expressing their joy by various gestures and adorned with vernal crowns scattered from their bosom flowers on the ground through the path in which the sacred crowd walked others with mirrors placed behind their backs showed to the goddess the obsequiousness of the crowd as if it had come for the purpose of meeting her there were also others who carrying ivory combs imitated the adornment and combing of royal hairs by the motion of their arms and the inflection of their fingers and there were likewise others who sprinkled the streets with drops of genial balsam and other ointments besides this there was a great multitude of men and women who propitiated the goddess the offspring of the celestial stars by lamps torches wax lights and other kinds of artificial light afterwards sweet symphonies resounded from the most delightful modulations of pipes and flutes a pleasant choir of the most select youths in splendid white garments every way closed followed them frequently singing an elegant song which an ingenious poet had composed through the favour of the muses and which explained the meaning of the procession pipers also consecrated to the great serapis proceeded among those musicians whose songs were antecedent to the greater vows and sung the accustomed modulation pertaining to the god and his temple the oblique pipe being extended to the right ear and there were likewise precursors who proclaimed that convenient room would be given for the sacred procession to pass after this there was an influx of a crowd of those who had been initiated in the sacred rites of the goddess consisting of men and women of every degree and of every age resplendent with the pure whiteness of linen garments the women had their anointed hair enfolded in a pellucid covering but the men had their hair perfectly shaven and the crown of their head was exceedingly bright these terrene stars also of the great religion of the goddess produced a sharp sound from the brazen silver and likewise golden rattles which they held in their hands but those principal men that presided over the sacred rites and who were clothed in a close-drawn garment of white linen hanging down to the extremities of their feet carried the most illustrious spoils of the most powerful gods and of these the first exhibited a lamp shining with a clear light not resembling those lamps of ours which illuminate nocturnal banquets but it was a golden boat cup which emitted a larger flame from an aperture in the middle the second was clothed in a similar manner but carried in both his hands altars to which the auxiliary providence of the supreme goddess gave a proper name the third proceeded raising a palm tree the leaves of which were subtly gilt and also the mercurial caduceus the fourth exhibited the symbol of equity viz a left hand fashioned from the palm or inner part expanded which seems to be more adapted to equity than the right hand because it is naturally sluggish 
and is endued with no craft and no subtlety. The same person also carried a golden vessel, which was round like the female breast, and from which he poured forth milk. The fifth bore a golden corn fan, full of golden branches, and another carried an amphora. In the next place, without delay, the images of the gods carried by the priests of Isis proceeded, not disdaining to walk with the feet of men, this terrifically raising a canine head, but that being the messenger of the supernal gods and of those in the realms beneath, with an erect face partly black and partly of a golden color, bearing in his left hand a caduceus and shaking in his right hand branches of the flourishing palm tree, whose footsteps a cow in an erect position immediately followed. This cow was the prolific resemblance of the all-parent goddess, and was carried on the shoulders of one of the blessed servants of this divinity, and who acted the part of a mimic as he walked. Another carried a sister or chest containing arcana, and perfectly concealing the mystic symbols of a magnificent religion, and another bore in his happy bosom the venerable effigies of the supreme divinity, which was not similar to any cattle or bird or wild beast, nor even to man, but was venerable for the subtlety by which it was invented, and also for its novelty, was an ineffable indication of a more sublime religion, and which was to be concealed in the greatest silence. But this effigies was fashioned after the following manner. There was a small urn, formed of splendid gold, most artificially excavated, the bottom of which was very round, and which was externally engraven with the admirable images of the Egyptians. The orifice of this urn, which was not much elevated, was extended into a prominent rivulet, but a handle adhered to the side opposite to the orifice, and receded from the urn by a spacious dilatation. On this handle an asp sat, raising its neck, which was scaly, wrinkled, and tumid, and embraced it with one fold of its body. And behold, the benefits and the destiny which the most powerful goddess had promised to me approached, and the priest was present, bringing with him my salvation, and adorned in a manner conformable to what the divinity had previously announced. In his right hand he carried the rattle of the goddess, which was to me a crown, and by Hercules a crown by a necessary consequence, because through the providence of the greatest goddess I vanquished the opposition of most cruel fortune, after having encountered so many labors and so many dangers. Nevertheless I did not run violently, though I was agitated by a sudden joy, fearing lest the tranquil order of religion should be disturbed by the hasty impetus of a quadruped. But I hesitatingly passed through the crowd, with a quiet and perfectly human step, and with a gradual obligation of my body, the people giving way to me through the interference of the goddess. By the priest, as I might very well perceive, recollecting the nocturnal oracle, and admiring the congruity of the office, which he was commanded to perform, immediately stood still, and spontaneously extending his right hand, presented to my mouth a crown of roses. Then I, trembling, and my heart leaping with continual palpitation, devoured with great desire and a greedy mouth the shining crown in which delightful roses were interwoven. Nor did the celestial promise deceive me, for immediately my deformed and brutal figure left me, and in the first place indeed my squalid hair fell off, and afterwards my thick skin became attenuated, my broad belly became narrow, and the soles of my feet passed into toes through my hooves. My hands are no longer feet, but are extended to their erect offices. My long neck is shortened, my face and my head become round, my enormous ears are restored to their pristine parvitude, my stony teeth return to those of a human size, and the tail, which before especially tormented me, was nowhere to be found. The people admire and the religious venerate so evident an indication of the power of the supreme divinity, and the magnificence and facility of my restoration which resembled the nocturnal images in my dreams." Extending likewise their hands to the heavens, they proclaimed with a clear and unanimous voice such an illustrious benefit of the goddess. But I, being fixed in excessive astonishment, remained silent. My mind not being capable of receiving a joy so sudden and so great, and I was dubious what I should first and principally say, 
whence i should assume the beginning of a new voice and more happily commence my speech as my tongue was now restored to me and in what magnificent language i should return thanks to so great a goddess the priest however who through the divine admonition knew all my calamities from the beginning though he himself also was astonished by that remarkable miracle having first signified his wish by a nod ordered that a linen garment should be given to me for the purpose of covering my nakedness for as soon as the ass had despoiled me of my abominable vesture i well fortified myself with a natural covering as much as it was possible for one who is naked to do by closely compressing my thighs and carefully placing my hands over my private parts then one of the religious cohort having promptly divested himself of his upper garment most rapidly covered me with it which being done the priest with a joyful countenance and by hercules astonished at my now human aspect thus addressed me o oh, lucius you have at length arrived at the port of quiet and the altar of pity having endured many and various labours and great tempests of fortune and been tossed about by mighty waves of calamity nor did the nobility of your race nor your dignity nor even the learning in which you abound at all benefit you but falling into servile pleasures through the lubricity of flourishing youth you have brought back an inauspicious reward of your unhappy curiosity the blindness of fortune however while she has tormented you by the worst of dangers has brought you by her improvident malignity to this religious beatitude let her now go and rage with the greatest fury and let her search for some other subject for her cruelty for hostile misfortune has no power over those whose service the majesty of our goddess vindicates to itself what advantage has iniquitous fortune derived from robbers from wild beasts from servitude from the various circuits of the roughest paths and from the fear of death to which you were daily exposed you are now therefore received into the protection of fortune but of the fortune that can see and who also illuminates the other gods with the splendour of her light assume now a more joyful countenance and more adapted to that white garment which you wear attend the pomp of your saviour goddess with triumphant steps let the irreligious see let them see and acknowledge their error behold lucius rejoicing in the providence of the great isis and freed from his pristine miseries triumphs in his own fortune nevertheless that you may be more safe and better protected become one of this holy order which you will hereafter rejoice that you embraced and now dedicate yourself to the service of our religion and voluntarily subject yourself to the yoke of this ministry for when you have once entered into the service of the goddess you will then in a greater degree enjoy the fruit of your liberty the excellent priest having thus prophesied and breathing with difficulty was silent end of chapter eleven part one read by todd albrick chapter eleven part two of the metamorphosis or golden ass this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Albrick. The Metamorphosis or Golden Ass by Apuleius. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter 11, Part 2. I afterwards walking, mingled with the religious crowd, accompanied the sacred pomp, being known and conspicuous to the whole city and distinguished by the fingers and nods of the men all the people spoke of me and said the august power of the omnipotent goddess has restored this man to the human form happy by hercules and thrice blessed is he who is deserved by the innocence and probity of the former part of his life such an illustrious protection from heaven so that after a manner being born again he is immediately affianced to the ministry of sacred rites while these things were said, and during the tumult of the festive vows proceeding gradually, we now approached to the shore of the sea, and came to that very place in which, on the preceding day, I, while I was yet an ass, had taken up my abode. 
the images which the priests of isis carried being there properly disposed the chief priest dedicated and consecrated to the goddess a ship most artificially fabricated on all sides variously adorned with the admirable pictures that is hieroglyphics of the egyptians and exquisitely purified with a burning torch an egg and sulphur at the same time pouring forth from his holy mouth the most solemn prayers the splendid sail of this blessed ship had a vow inscribed on in it in large letters these letters renewed the vow which had been made on shore for a prosperous event of the new navigation now the mast of that ship was raised which was a round pine tree tall and splendid and conspicuous by its remarkable top the stern also of the ship was decorated with a goose with an intorted neck and was refulgent through being covered with golden spangles and the whole of the polished keel consisted of shining citron wood then all the people as well as the religious and the profane emulously heaped together corn fans full of aromatics and things pertaining to supplications and poured into the sea a milky paste till the ship being filled with copious gifts and auspicious prayers was freed from the ropes that held the anchor and was restored to the sea with a peculiar and serene wind after likewise it had proceeded so far that the view of it was uncertain to us each of those who carried the sacred symbols again took what he had brought and began cheerfully to return to the temple in a decorous manner and in the same order of procession in which they came from it but when we arrived at the temple itself the chief priest and those who carried the divine images and who some time prior to this had been initiated in the venerable mysteries being received into the sanctuary of the goddess disposed in a proper order the breathing resemblances then one of these whom all of them called a scribe standing before the doors the company of the pastrophori which is the name of the members of that sacred college being cited as to an assembly uttered from a lofty chair auspicious wishes from a book in which they were written for the great emperor the senate and the equestrian order and for all the roman people and likewise for the nautical ships and for all those who are governed under the empire of this our hemisphere and then he pronounced in the greek tongue and after the grecian manner ploiophasia which signified that divine service was ended and that it was lawful for every man to depart which words were followed by a clamour of the people signifying that all things would happen felicitously to all of them afterwards the people being full of joy carrying with them branches of olive sweet herbs and garlands of flowers and having kissed the footsteps of the goddess departed to their own habitations nevertheless my mind would not suffer me to go even the breadth of a nail from that place but being attentive to the image of the goddess i recalled to my memory my former misfortunes swift fame however had not in the meantime been idle but had everywhere narrated in my country the adorable benefit of the provident goddess and my memorable fortune that is my restoration from the asinine to the human form at length therefore my domestics and servants and those who were nearly allied to me by the bond of consanguinity laying aside the sorrow which they had conceived from the false relation of my death and exhilarated by a sudden joy hastened immediately to see me who had been divinely saved and brought back as it were from the realms beneath and presented me with various gifts with the unexpected view of these i being delighted gave them thanks for their worthy gifts for my domestics had providently taken care to bring me what would be abundantly sufficient for the expenses of my dress and my food having therefore spoken to each of them as it was my duty to do and narrated to them my pristine sorrows and my present joy i again betook myself to a survey of the goddess which was to me most delightful and procured for myself a temporary habitation within the enclosure of the temple still applying myself to the private services of the goddess being inseparable from the society of the priests and a constant adorer of the great goddess nor did i pass any night or any sleep without some vision and admonition of this divinity but she ordered me by frequent mandates to be now initiated in her sacred mysteries to which i had been some time ago destined but i though it was what i very much desired was nevertheless restrained by religious fear for by diligent inquiry i knew that the service of religion was difficult that the abstinence which chastity required was sufficiently arduous and that life which is subject to many casualties is to be defended by cautious circumspection 
frequently revolving these things with myself i deferred the being initiated i know not how although hastening to the accomplishment of it on a certain night i appeared to myself to see in a dream the chief priest offering to me his full lap and on my asking what that was he answered me that the contents of his lap were sent to me from thessaly for that a servant of mine whose name was candidus had arrived from the same province when i awoke i revolved in my mind frequently and for a long time what the vision portended especially as i was certain that i never had any servant who was called by that name nevertheless i believe that some gain was undoubtedly signified by the priest offering me the contents of his lap thus being anxious and attentive to that more abundant gain i impatiently waited for the opening of the temple in the morning and while the white veils by which the image of the goddess was screened from the view of the profane being drawn aside in different directions we implored the venerable face of the goddess the priest going round the altars which were disposed in order applied himself to divine works and together with the usual prayers poured from a vessel water drawn from a fountain which was in the penetralia of the temple the sacred rites therefore being now properly performed the religious loudly announced the first hour of the day by their morning adorations and behold the servant suddenly came from my country whom i had there left after photis by her base errors had forced me to be tied by a rope that is to become an ass for my kindred had brought back with them my servants and also had recovered that horse of mine which i recognized by the spot on its back after it had been sold to various persons hence i then especially admired the sagacity of my dream that besides the congruity of the promised gain it had restored to me my horse which was of a white colour under the designation of the servant canadus after this i being still solicitous about the same thing assiduously applied myself to the worship of the goddess perceiving that the hope which i had conceived of future good was now confirmed by the present benefits nevertheless my desire of engaging in sacred offices increased daily more and more hence i frequently went to the chief priest and most earnestly entreated him to initiate me in the arcane mysteries of the sacred night but he though otherwise a severe man and celebrated by his observance of that abstemious religion deferring my request mildly and gently and in the way in which parents are accustomed to moderate the immature desires of their children allured my mind though otherwise anxious by the solace of better hope for he said that the day in which he who desired he might be initiated was indicated by the will of the goddess and that by her providence the priest was chosen who ought to perform the sacred rites and that by her mandate also the expense necessary for the ceremonies was ordained all which circumstances he thought should induce me to wait with obsequious patience since we ought by all means to avoid eagerness and obstinacy as faults and neither be dilatory when called nor precipitate when not called he added that there was not any one of their number who was so lost to a sense of propriety or rather so destined to death as to rashly and sacrilegiously dare to engage in the service of the goddess and thus contract a deadly guilt unless she peculiarly ordered him to do so for the gates of the realms beneath and the guardianship of life are placed in the hands of the goddess and the delivery of her mysteries is celebrated as a thing resembling a voluntary death and a precarious life because she is accustomed to choose for this purpose men who having arrived at a great age are now placed in the extreme boundary of their life but to whom nevertheless the great arcana of religion may be safely committed and who through her providence being after a manner born again are restored to the race of a new life it therefore was requisite that i should also wait for the celestial mandate although by the clear and manifest favour of the great goddess i had some time ago been called and destined to her blessed service and that i should now abstain from profane and nefarious food no less than other worshippers of the divinity in order that i might with greater rectitude accede to the more secret arcana of the most pure religion thus spoke the priest nor was my compliance broken by impatience but i attentively performed daily the laborious service pertaining to the observance of sacred rites with mild tranquillity and laudable silence nor did the salutary benignity of the powerful goddess deceive me 
nor torment me by the delay of a length of time but she clearly admonished me by no obscure mandates of obscure night that is in a nocturnal dream that the day was now arrived that had been always the object of my desire and in which she would put me in possession of my greatest wish she also informed me what sum of money would be requisite for my procuring the sacred apparatus and at the same time appointed for me as the minister of sacred rites that very mithras himself her own chief priest who she said was conjoined to me by a certain divine consent of the stars but i by these and other benevolent precepts of the supreme goddess being mentally refreshed sleep having left me though it was not yet clear day immediately proceeded to the dwelling of the priest and having found him then going out of his bedchamber i saluted him and i had now determined to request more firmly than ever that i might commence my religious service as a thing that was due to me but he as soon as he saw me began prior to me thus to speak o oh, my lucius how happy and blessed are you whom the august divinity has so greatly honoured by her propitious will and why said he do you now stand idle and make any delay the day sought by your continual wishes is now present to you in which you will be initiated in the most pious arcana of sacred rites by these my hands through the divine mandate of the multi-nominal goddess and the most humane old man taking hold of me by the hand led me immediately to the doors of the most ample temple and having performed the office of opening them in the accustomed solemn way and making the morning sacrifice he took from the most inward parts of the aditum certain books written in unknown characters that is in hieroglyphics partly compendiously suggesting the words of a discourse by the figures of animals of every kind and partly fortified against the inquisitive perusal of the profane by knotted accents and which were bent after the manner of a wheel and folded in each other like the tendrils of a vine from these books he informed me what must necessarily be prepared by me for the purpose of initiation immediately therefore i strenuously procured the previous requisites and somewhat more abundantly than i was ordered to do partly through myself and partly through my associates and when the time as the priest said required it he led me to the nearest bath which was surrounded by a company of religious men and when he had placed me in the accustomed bath he himself washed me and sprinkled me with water in the purest manner after he had first implored the pardon of the gods again also he brought me back to the temple and there placed me before the footsteps of the goddess two parts of the day having been now passed over and having given certain mandates in secret which are too holy to be uttered he clearly ordered before all that were present that i should abstain from luxurious food during those ten continued days and that i should not eat the flesh of any animal and should refrain from wine these precepts therefore having been properly observed by me with a venerable countenance the day had now arrived in which i was to appear before the image of the goddess isis in order to be initiated and the sun descending led on the evening then behold there was a conflux of the people on all sides every one honouring me with various gifts according to the ancient custom of sacred rites then also the priest all the profane being removed taking hold of me by the hand brought me to the penetralia of the temple clothed in a new linen garment perhaps inquisitive reader you will very anxiously ask me what was then said and done i would tell you if it could be lawfully told you should know it if it was lawful for you to hear it but both the ears and the tongue are guilty of rash curiosity nevertheless i will not keep you in suspense with religious desire nor torment you with long continued anxiety hear therefore but believe what is true i approach to the confines of death and having trod on the threshold of prosopine i returned from it being carried through all the elements at midnight i saw the sun shining with a splendid light and i manifestly drew near to the gods beneath and the gods above and proximately adored them behold i have narrated to you things of which though heard it is nevertheless necessary that you should be ignorant i will therefore only relate that which may be enunciated to the understanding of the profane without a crime the morning arose 
and the solemnities being performed, I came forth consecrated in twelve sacerdotal garments, in a dress indeed very religious, but of which I am not forbidden by any law to speak, because it was seen by many who were then present. For by order of the priest I ascended a wooden throne, which was in the very middle of the sacred dwelling, that is, of the temple, and was placed before the image of the goddess, and there I sat conspicuous, in a garment which was indeed linen, but was elegantly painted. A precious cloak also depended from my shoulders behind my back as far as to my heels. Nevertheless, to whatever part of me you directed your view, you might see that I was remarkable by the animals which were painted round my vestment in various colours. Here were Indian dragons, there Hyperborean griffins, which the other hemisphere generates in the form of a winged animal. Men devoted to the service of divinity called this cloak the Olympic garment, but in my right hand I carried a burning torch, and my head was decorously encircled with a crown, the shining leaves of the palm tree projecting from it like rays of light. Thus being adorned like the sun and placed so as to resemble a statue, on a sudden the veils being drawn aside, I was exhibited to the eyes of the people. Afterwards I celebrated the most joyful day of my initiation, as my natal day, by delightfully pleasant and facetious banquets. The third day also was celebrated with the same ceremonies, and was accompanied by a religious breakfast, and the legitimate consummation of the initiation. And having stayed for some days in that place, I enjoyed through the divine image, that is, the image of the goddess, an inexplicable pleasure, being indebted to it for a benefit which can never be repaid. Nevertheless, through the admonition of the goddess, having supplantly given her thanks, though not such as she deserved, yet to the best of my ability, I prepared myself very slowly to return home. Having therefore with difficulty burst the bonds of my most ardent desire of remaining with the goddess, I at length prostrated myself before her, and having for a long time wiped her footsteps with my face, the tears bursting forth, interrupting also my speech by frequent sobs, and as it were devouring my words, I thus addressed the goddess. Thou, O holy and perpetual saviour of the human race, being always munificent in cherishing mortals, dost employ the sweet affection of a mother on the misfortunes of the miserable. Nor is there any day or night or even a slender moment of time which passes unattended by thy benevolent interpositions. Thou protectest men both by sea and land, and dispersing the storms of life dost extend thy salutary right hand, by which thou drawest back the inextricably twisted thread of the fates, and dost mitigate the tempest of inclement fortune, and restrain the noxious courses of the stars. The supernal gods reverence thee, and those in the realms beneath attentively observe thy nod. Thou rollest the sphere of the universe round the steady poles, dost illuminate the sun, govern the world, and tread on the dark realms of Tartarus. The stars move responsive to thy command, the gods rejoice in thy divinity, the hours and seasons return by thy appointment, and the elements reverence thy decree. By thy nod blasts of wind blow, the clouds are nourished, seeds germinate and blossoms increase. Birds swiftly passing through the tracks of the air wild beasts wandering on the mountains serpents concealed in the ground and the enormous monsters that swim in the sea are terrified at the majesty which invests thy divinity but i who in celebrating thy praises possess but weak abilities and for offering sacrifices but a slender patrimony have by no means eloquence sufficient to express all that i conceive of the dignity of thy nature nor are a thousand mouths and as many tongues nor the eternal series of unwearied speech equal to the arduous task i will therefore be solicitous to perform that which a religious though poor man may be able to effect for i will image to myself thy divine countenance and most sacred deity and perpetually preserve it concealed in the most secret recesses of my soul after this manner having implored the supreme goddess i embraced the priest mithras whom I now called my parent, and clinging to his neck and giving him many kisses, I begged him to pardon me that I could not remunerate him in a manner adequate to such mighty benefits. And therefore, I had been for a long time engaged in giving him thanks, I at last departed and proceeded directly to my paternal abode, in order to revisit it after so long an absence. 
Hence, when a few days had elapsed, I rapidly collected together my viatica in bundles, through the admonition of the powerful goddess, and entering into a ship, I directed my course towards Rome. Being likewise certain of prosperous winds during my voyage, I quickly entered into port, afterwards travelled with great rapidity in a chariot, and arrived at this hallowed city on the day before the Ides of December in the evening. Nor afterwards was any concern of such principal importance with me as that of daily supplicating the supreme divinity of Queen Isis, who is there propitiated with the greatest veneration under the name of Isis Capensis, which appellation she is allotted from the situation of her temple. Lastly, I was an assiduous worshipper of her divinity, being a foreigner, indeed, in her temple, but a domestic of her religion. And behold, when the great sun, having passed through the sign-bearing circle, that is, the zodiac, having completed the year, the vigilant care of the beneficent goddess again interrupted my sleep, and again admonished me of initiation and sacred rites. And I wondered what she was preparing for me to do, and what future event she announced. For how is it possible I should not, since I appeared to myself to have been already abundantly initiated? While therefore I partly discuss my religious scruple in my own mind, and partly avail myself of the counsels of the priests, a novel and perfectly admirable circumstance took place. For I found that I was only initiated in the mysteries of the goddess, but not in those of the great god and supreme father of the gods, the invincible Osiris. For though the nature of their divinity and religion is connected, or rather is transcendently united, nevertheless there is the greatest difference in the initiations into their mysteries. Hence it ought to be known by me that the great God required that I should be one of his servants. Nor did the thing long remain ambiguous. For on the following night I saw in a dream one of the priests clothed in linen garments, who, carrying theosai and ivy, and certain other things of which it is not lawful to speak, placed them before my household gods, and occupying my seat, announced to me that I should prepare the banquets of a magnificent religion. He also walked gently, with a limping step, the ankle bone of his left foot being a little bent, in order that he might afford me some sign by which I might know him. All the darkness of ambiguity, therefore, was removed after such a manifest declaration of the will of the gods. Hence, as soon as I had performed the morning salutations of the goddess, I diligently inquired whether any one of the priests resembled him whom I had seen in a dream. Nor was he wanting, for I immediately beheld one of the pastophori exactly according with the nocturnal image, not only by the indication of his foot, but also by his stature and features and who, as I afterwards knew, was called Asinius Marcellus, a name not foreign to my transformation. Without delay, therefore, I went directly to him, who was not ignorant of what I intended to say, because he had already been admonished by a similar mandate, that he should initiate me in the mysteries of Osiris. For on the preceding night, while I was adapting crowns for the statue of the great god, he seemed to himself to have heard from that mouth of his by which he pronounces the destiny of everything, that he should send the Madorensian to him, who was very poor, and to whom his sacred mysteries ought immediately to be administered. For the god said that by his providence, renown from religious studies was prepared for the Madorensian and great gain for him, that is, for Asinius Marcellus. After this manner, being affianced to sacred concerns, I was retarded contrary to my wishes, through the slenderness of my means to pay the necessary expenses. For the money which I had spent in my journey had consumed the small substance of my patrimony, and the presence which it was requisite I should make in Rome, in order to be initiated in the mysteries of Osiris, exceeded those which I had before made in a Roman province. Hard poverty, therefore, being greatly adverse to my desire, I was tormented being placed according to the proverb between a sacrifice and a stone. Nor was I less urged by the pressing mandate of the god. And now, being frequently stimulated, not without great perturbation, at last by command of the divinity, having sold my garment, though but small, I collected a sum sufficient for the purpose. And this very thing I was expressly ordered to do. For the god said to me, would you at all spare your garments in attempting to procure anything which might administer to your pleasure? And are you now, when you are going to be initiated in such great mysteries, dubious whether you shall commit yourself to poverty, unattended with repentance? All things, therefore, being abundantly prepared, 
again being satisfied for ten days with inanimate food, and besides this being also instructed in the nocturnal orgies of the chief god Serapis, I now complied with the divine mandate, full of that confidence which my knowledge of a kindred religion produced. This circumstance afforded the greatest consolation to my peregrination, and at the same time more largely supplied me with the means of subsistence. For the deity of good event being favourable, I supported myself through the gain which I acquired in the forum by pleading causes in the Latin tongue. Behold, also, a short time after this, I was again excited by the unexpected and perfectly wonderful mandates of the gods, and was compelled to undertake a third initiation. But I, not lightly solicitous, and in a state of great suspense, frequently exercised my thoughts in considering what the intention could be of this new and unheard-of will of the gods, and what could still remain to be added to an initiation already twice repeated. For I said, both the priests have either wrongly advised me, or less fully, than they ought to have done, and by Hercules I now also began to entertain a bad opinion of their fidelity. While, however, I was thus fluctuating in a stormy sea of thought, and agitated as if I had been insane, the mild image of the god thus instructed me by a nocturnal vision. There is no reason, it said, that you should be terrified by the long series of religious rites, as if anything had been previously omitted, but you ought rather to be exceedingly joyful on account of the honour which the gods assiduously pay you, and to exult that you will thrice obtain a thing which is scarcely even once granted to others and you may justly presume from that number that you will always be blessed. Moreover, you will find that this third initiation is very necessary for you, if you now consider with yourself that the garment of the goddess with which you were invested in the province remains deposited in the same temple, and that you cannot supplicate at Rome on solemn days in a garment of this kind, or be rendered illustrious by that blessed vestment when you shall be commanded to put it on, in order, therefore, that you may be happy fortunate and healthful, again with a joyful mind be initiated in sacred mysteries by the command of the great gods Osiris, Serapis, and Isis. Thus far the persuasive majesty of the divine dream announced to me what was requisite to be done, nor did I neglect the affair afterwards, nor defer it by supine procrastination, but immediately relating what I had seen to my priest, I lived chastely, and abstained from animal food, and having of my own accord extended my abstinence beyond those ten days prescribed by a perpetual law, I brought what was requisite for my initiation, spending more largely from a pious intention than with a view to what was wanted. Nor by Hercules did I at all repent of my labours and expenses, for by the liberal providence of the gods I was sufficiently enriched by forensic gain. At length, after a very few days had elapsed, the god Osiris, who is the chief of the great gods, the highest of the greater, the greatest of the highest, and the ruler of the greatest, not being now transformed into some foreign person, but manifestly deigning to speak to me in his own divine words, seemed to me in a dream to declare that I should now indubitably plead causes in the forum with renown, and that I should not fear the slanders of the malevolent, which the learning I had acquired by laborious study would there excite and in order that I might minister to his sacred rites, mingled with a crowd of other religious men, he chose me to be one of his pastophori, and also placed me among the quinquennial decurions. And, lastly, my hair being again perfectly shaved, I joyfully performed the duties of that most ancient college, and which was established about the time of Scylla, not shading or covering my baldness, but rendering it in all parts conspicuous. End of chapter 11, part 2. Recording by Todd Albrick. End of the Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass, by Apuleius. Translated by Thomas Taylor.